So hey guys, welcome back to my channel. What if Naruto was Triton Devil and had angels as his slave? Movie. I like to think of myself as an observant woman. After all, I share a territory with a rival of mine, and we both have eyes for talent. Most of the humans here in Kuo, however, didn't have the kind of talent that I needed. Some barely had potential, and it would have taken much too long for us to bring them up to snuff for what lies ahead. Recently, I had been fortunate enough to gain a new pawn who holds a sacred gear. I thought it was simply a twice critical at first, but I realized later on that it was actually the fabled boosted gear, one of the thirteen Longinus. Alongside this pawn was a new bishop who also had a sacred gear, the Twilight Healing. While both are great for my peerage, they both still needed a great deal of help, Issei-san in particular. Sure, he had a great sacred gear, but he also had practically zero aptitude for magical capability. As for Asia-san, she is much too timid and kind-hearted for what's to come. As much as I hate to admit this, even if it's just to myself, she may become more of a liability in the future, a crippling point that will tear us down. I also hate to admit that Sona might be a better king than myself. She picked her peerage so easily, and she spent time and dedication into making them valued pieces of her peerage. She didn't wait like I did, something that has proven to be costly for me. I was worried as the date for my meeting with him drew closer, and I couldn't help but think that, despite everything we've done thus far, my efforts won't be enough for what may come. I needed time to think, so I didn't show up for school and took a walk through my town. I had hoped to clear my head and come up with something, but the stress and anxiety proved stronger than I estimated. It wasn't until I passed by a new music store, one that was playing some soothing music from their outdoor speakers, that I found something to help me calm down. Rias Gramori curiously opened the door to the music store, taking a cursory glance at the different instruments and equipment that was on display. She saw guitars, pianos and keyboards, drum sets, different forms of brass instruments like trumpets and the like, and even some software that helped with musical editing and similar intentions. Running the store was a woman with stunning white hair that reached her waistline, teal eyes that almost glowed, and a pale complexion that was flawless. She was dressed in a black button-down shirt, matching slacks, and white shoes. Around her neck was a tie that was as teal as her eyes while her hair had messy bangs, but they just added to her appeal. Welcome, she greeted, can I help you with anything? I heard music playing on the speakers outside, Rias answered. It was nice, and I was just wondering who was playing. The woman raised a brow with an amused twitch of the lips. Ah, I am glad that someone appreciates his efforts. That would be someone who hangs out here a bit too much. He's in the back, if you want to meet him. Nodding, the red-headed young woman gave a grateful smile. Thanks. No problem. Oh, just to warn you, the woman began. He's not exactly someone who can hold a conversation. Rias raised a brow in curiosity before she mentally shrugged it off and went to the back. Going through the door, her blue-green eyes widened slightly at the studio before her that was filled with state-of-the-art equipment that looked far superior to whatever the store itself was selling. And, sitting at a piano with large orange headphones, was a blonde teen that looked to be her age. He had wild blonde hair that was slightly matted down by his headphones, and strangely whiskered cheeks that reminded her of Kitsune Yokai. He was surprisingly dressed in the Kuo Academy uniform, but his tie was loosened and the top button was undone, giving him a more comfortable look. The blazer of the uniform was draped over one of the chairs in the studio, and he seemed to be lost in the music, music she couldn't hear because his headphones were plugged into the speakers. She spotted an extra pair by the computers and sound systems, so she walked over and put them on before plugging them into another auxiliary port. As soon as she did, she felt the soothing sounds of the music produced wash over her. Its effect was almost instant, and she felt her worries drown away in the sound. The gentle sounds of the woodwinds blended so beautifully with the strums of the guitar at the beats of the drum. And at the core of it all was the piano keystrokes that were supplied by the blonde seated away from her. Relaxing into her seat, she closed her eyes and simply enjoyed the music with her enhanced devil senses. It was a wonderful feeling, having her troubles simply fade away with the symphony. She recognized the style as jazz in nature, but it held a certain flair to it that she couldn't help to appreciate. Slowly, 
The music faded into silence, and she opened her eyes to look at the blonde teen. He slowly opened his own, and they were a stunning shade of azure blue that looked to be as deep as the oceans themselves. A faint smile was seen on his face, one that only enhanced his natural roguish appeal. She smiled as well and removed her headphones just as he did. She slowly made her way over to him as he pulled out a small laptop and typed in some notes. He must have heard her approach, for he looked up as soon as she stepped onto the smooth carpet his piano rested on. That was wonderful, she praised, earning a curious look from him. Your music, she clarified. I listen to you play. Realization hit him, and he turned back to his laptop with a noticeable flush on his cheeks. Huh, he must not receive many compliments. I can't believe I never noticed him before at the academy. He's definitely got a face to remember with those markings. The door to the studio opened, and the woman at the front walked in with a small smile. All right, Naruto, she began. Time for you to get going. It's been well over the hour you requested. He turned to her for a moment before closing his eyes with a defeated sigh. Nodding in understanding, he packed up his laptop in its carry-on case and shouldered it while carrying his school bag lazily by its top strap. As he walked out, he grabbed his blazer and carelessly laid it over his other shoulder before waving at the woman. She in turn waved back with her smile becoming a grin. See you soon, yeah. He waved over his shoulder as he left the store, Rias and the woman exiting the studio to re-enter the main room of the building. I see what you mean about him not being a conversationalist, the Grimori heiress mused aloud. Yeah, that's how he was when I first met him. Took me weeks before I figured out he was mute, she replied offhandedly, catching Rias' interest. Mute, I thought he just kept to himself. Well, that too, but he showed me he was mute after a couple of weeks. It was during one of my random spiels that I asked his opinion on, and he just answered back in sign language. Oh, that must have been why she never really noticed him. In Kuo, a majority of the students were rather loud and excitable, especially when certain people were within view. How often does he come here? A few times a week. He's always working on different tracks, and he told me that he wanted to make a CD someday when he was finished. How long has he been working on it? Here, the woman smiled fondly and looked at nothing in particular. Going on two years now. Two years, Rias repeated, shocked at how long it was taking. The first year was actually me showing him a few things, mostly how to use the editing equipment in the studio. After a while, he found his own groove and rolled with it, pun intended. The two women shared a small laugh at the simple joke. Well, thanks for introducing me and telling me a bit about him. With that, she walked out of the store and headed back to the academy. She took hurried steps down the path Naruto walked before she spotted him a fair distance away, sporting his orange headphones once more as he strolled down the sidewalk. Not wanting to lose him in the crowd he was about to cut through, she hurried after him. As she power walked, so that it wouldn't look so strange, she pushed her senses outwards to try and get a feel for the blonde teen. She didn't know why she did, but a nagging feeling in the back of her mind prompted her to do so. And what she felt echo back to her made her glad she listened to that feeling. She felt an above-average level of power from Naruto, with most of it centered around his upper chest, just below his neck. A surge of excitement rushed through her, and she smiled brightly before changing her pace to a light jog. She noticed him pause in his own steps and turn back to look at her with a raised brow. This only made her mentally smirk, for there was no way he would have known she was coming since he was wearing those headphones. It meant that he must have sensed her approach, which further proved that he had some hidden power. Pleased to see that he waited for her to catch up to him, he regarded her silently with his brow still raised. I was hoping to walk with you back to the academy, she answered his silent question. He tilted his head and raised a hand to speak to her in sign language, something she hadn't needed to know beforehand. I can't understand what you're trying to tell me, Naruto-san. He blinked in surprise and narrowed his eyes slightly. Seeing the accusation, she raised her hands up placatingly and explained, that woman at the store told me your name. I apologize if I am coming off as rude. His accusing look sobered to a casual one, making her smile. I don't think we've ever met before today. He shook his head, prompting her to offer him a hand. I am Rias Gramori. It's nice to meet you, 
Naruto-san. He looked at the offered hand for a moment before he took it in his own and shared a shake with the beautiful redhead. Once his hand was free again, he set down his school bag and pulled out a small notebook and a pen before scribbling something quickly on it. Turning it to her, she read, I am Naruto Uzumaki. Nice to meet you too. She nodded after reading it, prompting him to put the notebook in the small pocket on the front of his shirt. Something that wasn't on standard uniforms. She said nothing about it, simply falling in step with him as they headed for the academy. As they walked, she noted that he was a head taller than she was, and his marked cheeks looked natural instead of drawn on. He also had his headphones hang around his neck, resuming the music at full volume so that they could project it loud enough to hear. Are you a part of the music club, Naruto-san? She asked, getting a headshake from him. Really, I am surprised, you definitely have talent. He looked away from her at that, and she noticed his cheeks were once again flushed, proving her earlier theory correct. He really didn't get many compliments if he reacted so bashfully. Did you try to apply for the club before? She continued, earning another shake of the head. Why not, if I may ask? He pulled out his notebook and scribbled his answer before handing it to her. I didn't feel like it. I've listened to them before, and I don't like the style they use. Hum, yes. I suppose a clash of styles would be problematic, she handed him back his notebook and continued, well, have you signed up for any club? She was pleased to see him respond in a negative, this time giving her more attention. You know that Sauna will scold you if you don't join one, right? I tend to avoid her whenever she's nearby, I have more than enough tardies and absences to warrant punishment. She giggled at his blunt response. Somehow, I am not surprised, no offense. He shrugged and waved her off, a small smile on his face. She mentally noted that it was a nice smile. What if I offered you a way out of trouble? He raised a brow before motioning her to go on. I run the occult research club, and I'd like to offer you an invitation to it. He looked skeptical and wrote down, why? I've never really shown interest in the occult before. You don't need to have an early interest to become a member. Besides, you won't know if it does interest you unless you give it a try. He turned away with a thoughtful expression, and she mentally hoped he would agree to join. It was an agonizing, for her, couple of minutes before he turned back to her and shrugged with a faint smile, nodding afterwards in agreement. She gave him a beautiful smile in response that made his cheeks flush once more. Excellent, he'll come find you after classes are over. He blinked at how quickly she wanted him to join before noting how they had already walked through the gate and were on the school grounds. Il also talked to Sauna and asked her to back off on scolding you, she continued before adding mentally, and also to back off in general. Good thing I noticed you first. Take that, Sona. He nodded in understanding, and she bid him goodbye before heading off to her current class. Holding up his wrist, he checked the time and saw that he had history next. With a grimace, he ignored the schedule and headed for the school's roof. He wasn't a history buff, and he wasn't planning on becoming one. So, I believe he has a sacred gear, Rias concluded, informing her, Queen, Akino Himahima. Akino tapped her chin thoughtfully, giving a small hum as she went over what her, king, and closest friend had told her. Uzumaki, Uzumaki, I don't think I've heard much about him. I suppose any rumors about him are as silent as he is. That was in slightly poor taste, Rias admonished. Era, my apologies. If I am going to add Naruto-san into my peerage, then I want the rest of us to welcome him fairly and not poke fun at his mutism. I am going to bring him here personally, so please make sure the others are here beforehand. Yes, Bushu. Finding Naruto was a bit more difficult than she thought. After getting a copy of his schedule from Sona, she expected to find him in his calligraphy class. Instead, she was informed by the teacher that he was absent and that they hadn't heard from Naruto all day, neither have his other teachers. So, while she outwardly made it look like she was searching for him, inwardly she used her senses to find him. She got a response from the roof, and she made her way there to see him leaning against the railing with his hands in the air in front of him. She raised a brow when she saw that nothing was there but then noted that he had his headphones on again. She saw him swaying his head to music she couldn't hear, his fingers dancing in the air as if they were hitting the keys of a piano. 
Realization came to her as she saw that he was playing along with the music, immersing himself in it despite not having a live instrument in front of him. Such dedication to an art made her unconsciously smile, for she believed that he could apply that dedication to other areas, namely to her peerage. Walking over to him, she wasn't surprised to see him stop playing when she got within a certain distance. He turned to her and removed his headphones, giving her a small wave in greeting. I was looking for you, Naruto-san, she informed him. I told you I would find you after classes ended, remember? He nodded once. Well, come along, then. I am going to take you to the clubroom now to meet the others. Nodding again. Naruto put away his headphones and gathered his bags, stuffing the school blazer into his school bag so he wouldn't have to wear it. His clothes also remained loose, which she couldn't blame him for. For girls as gifted as her in certain areas, the uniforms were very restricting. Leading him out of the main school building and for the older one, she guided him inside and took her position behind her desk while the other members of the occult research club regarded him. He couldn't help raising a brow at the members, not expecting them all to have something in common. For starters, Akino was one of the two great ladies of the academy. She had her own fan base, just like Rias did. It wasn't exactly surprising to see her in the club, though, considering how often the two were seen together. Kiba Yudo, who was regarded for his politeness and good looks, was a surprise. Naruto had seen him a couple of times helping the Kendo club and he thought his fellow blonde was a member, despite the club being comprised of nothing but female students. Kaneko Tuju was known as the school mascot for her adorable looks. Honestly, Naruto couldn't blame the students for seeing the petite girl that way. Her features reminded him of cats, and he absently wondered if she styled her hair to look like folded cat ears. Issei Hiodo was a definite surprise to see, considering who he was and the relentless rumors read facts about him. He was a pervert of the highest order, and he was damn proud of it. Naruto couldn't help but praise him for being so adamant in his beliefs and admirations, absently finding himself jealous of how vocal Issei could be while he couldn't utter a word. And lastly was Asia Argento, the newest girl of the school that was rumored to be staying at Issei's home. He didn't bother listening to rumors, preferring to determine the worth of them with his own eyes and ears. Based on how close Asia was sitting to Issei, Naruto couldn't deny that something was going on between them. Perhaps a crush on her part for the resident pervert. Absently, he remembered his late mother telling him that you don't always choose who you fall in love with. Along with that was something along the lines of look underneath the underneath, something that a family friend always liked to say. Huh, wonder how Kakashi is doing, anyway, he mused before Ria spoke up and reclaimed his attention. Everyone, this is Naruto Uzumaki, she informed. He will hopefully become the newest member of our club. He raised a brow at the hopefully she threw in there. Wasn't he already accepted by her? The others introduced themselves. Akino's voice held a slightly sultry undertone that he easily picked up. He couldn't help but blush at her voice, and at how she looked to him with interest. Kiba was as polite as always, offering a smile and a handshake that Naruto readily accepted. He was always happy to get a warm welcome. Kaneko was rather stoic in her greeting, which strangely only added to her natural, cat-like charm. He didn't understand it, but it probably wasn't important, so, he simply gave her a wave. Issei looked to him briefly before turning away with a grumble of damn blondes trying to steal his harem. A sweat drop formed on the back of Naruto's head at that. Wow, was this guy insecure? He was mute and he still had more confidence in himself than Issei seemed to have. And lastly was Asia, who walked over and gave a polite bow in greeting that he returned. Her innocent aura was absolutely adorable, and he found it an endearing quality that would hopefully remain with her. Innocent people tended to have the most impactful opinions, he believed, for they weren't yet biased by the beliefs of others. Now, Naruto, Rias continued, getting his attention once more, you probably noticed that I said you would hopefully become a member, right? He nodded with a confused expression. Well, the reason for that is because your acceptance is entirely up to you. He raised a brow at that, even more confused than before. There are things you need to know before I ask you if you wish to join us. She paused to take a breath before looking to him seriously, making him pay closer attention. Let me tell you about the three factions. So, 
Rias continued as she ended her explanation, now that you are aware of the three factions, and of how all of us here are of the devil faction, I need to know if you'll still accept becoming a member of this club. Naruto, who had been listening attentively since she started speaking, took a moment to think about everything she had told him. It was definitely a lot to consider, especially the fact about the club being a front for this peerage thing that Rias was king of. Slowly, he pulled out his handheld notebook and took the time to write out his question. Once he finished, he offered it to the red-headed woman. Akino acted as the passer, handing the notebook to her king to read. I understand what you've been saying, but I still don't know enough to make a solid decision. What are the benefits and consequences of this choice? Is it simply a fancy way of saying that I am a slave to you, or is there something more that I am missing? You're asking me to change who I am so drastically, and I can't make a call so quickly. She nodded as she read, seeing where he was coming from. I suppose I should be happy that you're not rushing into this. It shows that you don't blindly follow offers with tempting outcomes. Bushu, Akino spoke up. Perhaps we should give him time to think about his answer after we answer the questions he offered us. Let him reflect on what he's been told and come to a decision on his own. Rias nodded in agreement, despite how much she wished Naruto would choose right away. Time was running out, and Akino knew that, but Akino was also someone Rias trusted immensely. If she said to give Naruto time, then she would accept that advice. Very well, then. She turned her attention back to Naruto and continued, the benefits of becoming a devil are quite a lot. You can gain access to magical power, your physique and lifespan improve greatly to the point of living hundreds of years, you gain the protection of myself and my peerage, and you may one day have a peerage of your own if you rise up in ranking. Think about it, Uzumaki-san. Issei chimed in, a noticeable blush on his face as he giggled pervertedly. You can have your own harem if you work hard enough. Isn't that awesome? Naruto gave him a dry look alongside Kaneko. Asia looked uncomfortable about Issei's declaration, and surprisingly frowned in what Naruto assumed to be jealousy. Guess I was right about her having a thing for the pervert. Wonder why, though. As for the others, they merely looked amused at Issei's comment, though, Naruto noted that it wasn't cruel amusement. It was more like an adult watching a child at play and finding amusement in it. Ignoring his fellow classmate for the time being, Naruto turned back to Rias and waved for her to continue. Rias noticeably frowned at what she needed to say next. Unfortunately, the consequences, as you put it, are about as much as the benefits. For starters, you will gain a weakness for light and holy based items or weaponry. Also, if you were to speak the name of the Almighty, it causes some mental pain, which can prove to be fatal if you aren't careful enough. She steepled her hands in front of her face as she continued, you also become a natural enemy of the other two factions, the Angels and Fallen. And another negative, if you really see it that way, is that you aren't fully human anymore. However, Kiba cut in, while you are classified as a servant of Bushu, the Grimori family have been known to be the most understanding of masters. They treat their servants and peerages with respect and care, comparing them to a family. Bushu is a good king too. Kaneko added from her seat, still as stoic as ever. She saved my life, Issei added, scratching the back of his head awkwardly. I'd be dead if I wasn't brought into her peerage, Asia Chan too. Naruto looked to the ex nun with a raised brow, making her look away shyly. I, it's true, she stuttered out, not used to having attention from others. I was able to have friends when I joined the peerage, and I am happy to have them. She turned back to him with a bright smile. I don't regret my decision to accept her offer. Rias gave the others a grateful smile for their supportive words before she turned back to Naruto. I've told you quite a bit today, so, take some time to think it over, like Akino suggested. However, I hope you can give me an answer in a couple of days at the least, no more than two from now. Akino handed Naruto his notebook back, and he nodded to Rias before he offered the others a small smile. Grabbing his things, he headed out the door and for home. The queen turned to Rias and asked, would you like me to follow him? We don't know if any fallen stragglers are around after the fiasco with those four others a few weeks ago. Please do, just make sure he gets home safely, Rias replied, prompting Akino to leave the clubroom. Turning to the others, the heiress concluded, 
That'll be all for today. Focus on any jobs or flyers you have for the time being. Yes, Bushu, her peerage responded before the club dispersed for the day. Arriving at his apartment complex, Naruto gave a friendly wave to the owner of the building. She was a nice woman who had offered him a room for cheap if he helped with small repairs alongside his rent. He was happy to accept the deal, considering how most of his funds came from the dwindling money his last caretaker left him in his part-time job. Heading up to the second floor, he entered his apartment and set his things by the front door. He had a thoughtful expression as he kicked off his shoes and moved over to his small couch. Taking a seat, he leaned back against the cushions and reflected over what he had been told by Rias and the others. In all honesty, Naruto had known that there were people in the world that couldn't be considered human. He himself wasn't fully human, either. His mother was only half human, and her mixed blood kept him from being truly human. Not that he was complaining, of course. He was proud of the blood he carried, and he couldn't help but consider it responsible for his immediate interest in music. After all, what race held as much respect for that art than the sirens? But, on the flip side, it was that same blood that was responsible for his mutism. A siren's voice is a dangerous thing, something his mother told him many times before he lost her. According to his parents, on the day he was born and he gave his first cry, he unconsciously drew upon his latent vocal power and it was mixed in. Unfortunately, a newborn has no control of themselves or any sort of power they may have and the stress that was put on his vocal cords was too much to handle. The result was the loss of his voice, his first cry being his only cry. While his mother tried to hide it, he could tell that Kashina was devastated over what happened. He was too, for he would never be able to sing with his mother, never know what his voice may have sounded like. But he never blamed her, or her blood, something she did constantly whenever she thought he wasn't listening. He loved his mother, he loved his siren heritage, and he loved music. That was enough for him. After his mother was killed, his father Minato tried to care for him alone. However, being a single father was hard for the man. He tried his best, even having Kakashi give him a hand on a few occasions, and Naruto loved the man, but he was still glad that he had called his own mother for help. Grandma Tsunade was a wonderful woman, and her niece was like the sister he never had. He believed that things would be okay, and that he would heal from the loss. That is, until he lost the remainder of his family barring Kakashi. Naruto still didn't know who did it, but all he remembered was coming home from school to the site of police at his home and a crime scene unit gathering evidence. Based on what he had learned from Rias, along with his mother's otherworldly blood, Naruto knew now that it couldn't have been done by humans, unless they had holy or demonic weapons to pull it off. There was no fire, but the wounds he saw on his family looked burnt at the edges. Not to mention the strange bullet holes that they suffered, but no bullets on the scene. Sure, the killers could have picked up the bullets, but there still should have been at least one or two that were stuck in the bodies. After that horrible day, Naruto stayed with his dad's teacher, a perverted writer named Jiraiya. The man made Issei's peeping look amateurish, and he proved to be a self-proclaimed master of peeping. It was his excursions that helped inspire him to write his Ika Ika series, which wound up being a major hit. All that showed Naruto, though, was how many perverts there were in the world, and it was sadly a rather high number. Now, he had a great appreciation for the fairer beep, but he wouldn't view them as simple pleasures to the eyes or body. He wanted something more in a significant other, someone who could be independent, strong, thoughtful, and hopefully have as much of a love for music as he did. Sadly, he hadn't found her yet, but he wasn't giving up hope. While the man was a massive pervert, Jiraiya was still a man who lent a hand and an ear whenever Naruto needed one. He was a support that Naruto needed, considering how Kakashi had been called back into service not long after his family's death. The blues never stopped playing for Naruto's life, though. Jiraiya had grown ill a few years ago, and his aged body wasn't strong enough to fight it off. He ended up asking the doctors to pull the plug and left Naruto the rights to his books. He didn't want them, though, he just wanted to stop losing people he cared about. The rights were eventually sold to a group of authors who worked for Jiraiya, and it was the profit he made that helped him get by for so long. Most of it went towards food, house payments, and education, 
all of which ate away at it faster than he realized they would. By the time he entered Kuo Academy, he had sold Jiraiya's old home in exchange for his current apartment and found himself a part-time job so that he wouldn't go under. He still found it ironic that he worked at an establishment that sold a food he and his mother both loved. Back to Ria's offer, Naruto was on the fence about it. It was tempting for sure, but the downsides were just as much as the upsides. They balanced out, with one major consideration standing out in the forefront. If he accepted, he gave up his life and freedom. If he denied it, he kept his freedom, but he may lose potential companions in the process. It was something he craved ever since he lost Jiraiya and was left alone. He still wished Kakashi would leave the service, but the man dedicated his life to it, for it was the service that his friends and squad mates Obito and Rin sacrificed their lives for. Naruto respected that decision, once again remembering a lesson he had learned from the people who cared for him. That lesson was those who break laws and rules are s beep, but those who forsake friends and family are worse than s beep. Kakashi didn't want to forsake their memory, and Naruto would respect the mon's decision and resolve. That still didn't lessen the pain of being alone, though. He gave a silent sigh as he laid himself across his couch, staring blankly at the ceiling. What should I do? He mused, hoping for an answer. None came. Not that he was surprised. Looking at the time, he noted that it was getting late. So, he decided to put the thought of Rhea's offer in the back of his mind in favor of making some dinner and getting some rest. Head ponder on it some more tomorrow. It's not like he would go to school where it would only distract him. Uzumaki-kun didn't show up for school today, Bushu, Akino informed Rias as she handed her some freshly made tea. I assume he's avoiding this place so he can think in private. That's fine, Rias replied after taking a sip. He seems like a trustworthy person, so I doubt he'll skip out on giving me an answer, even if it's to decline my offer. What if he does? Akino pressed, looking concerned for her closest friend. What will we do? What we've been doing before I noticed him, Rias answered. I can't expect Naruto to be the defining piece that will secure me a victory against Riser. She frowned in distaste at the mere mention of his name. If he accepts, then he'll be happy but if he declines, he'll respect that decision. I can't force my needs onto others, otherwise they will be proven right about us devils and our selfish ways. Akino nodded in understanding, though she held a faint frown that caught Rhea's eye. What is it? Did something seem, off about Uzumaki-kun? Off. In what way? The queen shook her head unsurely. I don't know, he felt like a human with an above-average aptitude, but I can't help but think that we may have missed something. Maybe it was just his sacred gear, Rias suggested. We aren't exactly aware of what it is, after all. Or if he even has one, Akino argued calmly. It could just be something unique about him in general. Perhaps, but we should nt spend so much time wondering about it. We need to focus on Issei and Asia's training. If I am going to challenge Riser to a rating game, we all need to be as ready as possible. Understood, Bushu, panting in exhaustion. Naruto wiped the sweat from his brow as a grin formed on his dirty and scuffed face. His eyes held a green glow that bled back into their natural blue, gazing at the fruits of his training. A trench was seen on the ground, moving from his standing position to a tree before him. As for the tree itself, it had been vertically bisected. Both halves of the tall tree had tipped over beneath their weight, and he could see that the tree behind the first had a nice, deep cut going into its bark. His grin grew and he gave a pleased fist pump for his success. Ever since he had discovered this power, he had been trying to gain some measure of control over it. It wasn't easy, for he was working with something that he couldn't tell anyone about. If the government found out, he would surely be hunted down and brought in as a possible weapon. He didn't want that, he wanted to live his life away from military. Once the excitement left him, he walked over to his duffel bag and grabbed a bottled water taking a generous helping of the soothing liquid within. Another downside of his ruined vocal cords was how sensitive they were, and how they constantly grew sore. Drinking water helped, somewhat, or at least it felt like it did. He looked up and saw that the moon was already getting pretty high in the sky. It was time to call it a night then. Gathering his things, he left the woods and headed for his apartment for a well-deserved meal and rest. During his training, he thought some more about Rhea's offer. 
Since he was so on the fence about it, he thought of a possible solution. He just hoped that it would work out with the beautiful redhead. Mentally groaning at that offhand thought, Naruto blamed his dad for his interest in red hair. It was that interest that helped him meet his mother, after all. You're serious, aren't you? Rias asked in surprise after reading Naruto's answer to her offer. Nodding, Naruto gave her a determined smile. His answer made sense to him, considering he had experienced it before when Jiraiya had him some lessons on running a company. Most times, employees were hired right on the spot because their skill sets were what the company needed. But, sometimes a potential employee was placed on something called a probationary period. It was a time before full-time hire where the hopeful employee proved that they had what it took to be part of the company. They were still paid for any work performed, but, they could be denied at any time the employer felt they wouldn't be a good fit. If that worked in the real world, why not apply that concept to this whole peerage thing? He would be a temporary member with the option to leave or be denied within the time frame allowed. It was perfect. I, don't know what to say to this. It's unheard of. Rias continued, still getting over the surprise at such a proposal. I don't even know if it's possible. Naruto tilted his head at her reply before he wrote a rebuttal. You know the devil who created those evil pieces, right? Why not propose this idea to them? I don't mind being the one to test it. You can't be serious, she argued, looking to him in concern, which caught him by surprise. If it fails, you would become a devil by force, or something worse might happen. I can't just put your life at risk when you don't need to accept my offer. It's crazy. But you aren't the one risking my life, he wrote back before he gave her a grin. Thumbing his chest, he mouthed out, I am. She frowned at him, moving around her desk so she could stand directly in front of him. Naruto, I can't let you do this. Please, we can figure something else at a later time. She bit her lip for a moment before she finished, don't ask me to do this. Her blue-green eyes locked onto his blue, and she found herself getting lost in their depths. Such a feeling stunned her, for she never thought she would ever meet someone with such an intense gaze. And that intensity was accompanied by a determined grin. He only nodded, and she knew then that there was no way she would convince him to back down from this. He had made his choice, and he would stick by it. For someone who can't speak, he sure as hell can send a message, she couldn't help thinking, unable to fight a small smile from forming. Sighing in defeat, she nodded in agreement. Fine, I'll call my brother and see if he could speak with Lord Beelzebub. Ill, she paused, visibly anxious, try to tell you his answer tomorrow. He grinned at her reassuringly before he placed a hand on top of her head. The grin forced his eyes closed and he chuckled, missing her cheeks flush slightly at what would be perceived as an affectionate gesture. Removing his hand, she noticed that his warmth went with him as he waved her goodbye and walked out of the clubroom. Unable to do nothing but stare at his back as he walked away with confidence, she whispered aloud, I hope this will work. Era, a familiar, teasing voice spoke up, making Rias mentally groan. That was rather sweet of him, assuring you like that. Don't look too far into it, Akino, Rias warned, giving her queen an annoyed look, complete with brow twitch. He's just a nice guy, is all. Oh, I am sure he is, agreed the Natashiko woman. I hope you don't mind if I try to steal away his niceties from you, Bushu. She giggled in a conspiring manner. I'd love to have him, under me. Rias fought a shiver at that. She respected Akino's sadism and enjoyment of teasing innuendos, but, sometimes they left rather, vivid mental images. Those very images ganged up on her thought process, and she pondered what Naruto would look like in a more appealing outfit. He was a handsome man, after all, and the academy uniform did not do him justice. Growling to herself, she brutally squashed those traitorous thoughts and prepared to contact her brother. That didn't stop her cheeks from getting flushed. Not that Akino was any better off, considering she was the one who brought up such thoughts. A probationary piece, you say. Ajuka Beelzebub, one of the four Satans, repeated in interest. Nodding in confirmation was someone who looked like an older male version of Rias. He was the holder of the title Lucifer, and once went by the name Sirzex Grimori. However, he dropped his family name after taking the title, leaving Rias as the next heir to the Grimori name. 
It was something Rias Tan asked me to bring up to you. Apparently, she has her eyes set on a potential new member of her peerage, and they want a trial period before they give a solid answer. Think it might be possible, Ajuka. Of course, it's possible, anything's possible, Sirzex. The problem isn't in possibility, it's in results. Ajuka turned to his equipment, going over various data before pulling out his files on the evil pieces. I could easily make something to act as a temporary, or as your sister called probationary, piece. The problem is, I won't know the effect it will have on the target unless I see the results for myself. He waved off his friend and added, I doubt anyone would be foolish enough to volunteer for something with such a risk. Actually, Sears X began, giving an amused smile, the potential member already offered to be a test subject for the piece. He couldn't help but find enjoyment in the surprised look Ajuka gave him. So, since you can make one, and someone is volunteering, I'd like to request one right now for my little sister. Sighing in amused defeat, the holder of Beelzebub fiddled with his equipment before activating it. The piece created was a pawn with archaic markings littering it. Before you ask, those brands are what make the piece temporary. Your sister simply needs to push her power into it before placing it in the person she's interested in. If everything goes well, she should be able to just as easily remove the piece by pulling it out with her power. Grabbing the offered item, Sears X sent it off to his sister using his personal magic portal. Giving his friend a grateful smile, the Lucifer stated, it'll make sure to have Rhea send you her findings on the piece as she uses it. Shed better, it's not every day I do favors like this, even for an old friend's family member. He then gave said friend a stern look and added, I expect to have this favor returned also. I'll make it up to you, Sears X promised with a friendly smile before he left Ajuka to his work. Arriving back in his office, he found his wife and maid waiting patiently for him. Well, Rias Tan has a way to increase her numbers, temporarily, anyway. You do realize that this may seem unfair regarding the contract, right Lord Lucifer? Grafia queried. Sears X mentally sighed at how his wife demanded to be professional during times they were working. It bothered him to be addressed by a title by his wife, despite her being his maid. As her brother, I am allowed to do one thing to assist her in this, so long as it isn't anything major, he explained to her. That was something our families agreed on when I tied to argue the marriage contract. The way I see it, Helping Rias get another pawn, one that might not even be a permanent member of her peerage, isn't major. How often has a single pawn tipped the balance of a rating game, after all? Grafia could have pointed out the various times a pawn did decide the outcome, but deep down, she too wanted to help Rias. They were family, after all, and she never enjoyed seeing her family in distress. So, she remained silent and resumed helping her king and husband with his work. Sitting at her desk in her clubroom, Rhea stared down at the item that could possibly be the boon she desperately needed. She hesitated to reach out for it, which confused her. She never hesitated before, so why was she doing so now? A brief memory of Naruto's smile entered her thoughts, and she shook her head before frowning. Come on, now, I can't believe I am getting so worked up over a random guy, she admonished herself, reaching out and grabbing the probationary pawn. She turned it in her hand before she pushed some of her power into it, making the brands on its body glow as fierce a red as her hair. She absently appreciated how the red contrasted the black coloring of the piece, and at the same time, she gained a hopeful smile. Maybe, she had a chance now. How do you feel? Rias asked the blonde musician, having just put the probationary piece into him. He was currently laid across the couch in the orc clubroom. A hand reached up and rubbed his chest where the piece had sunken into him. The feeling it gave off was hard to explain, but it was almost like his body turned into water just long enough for it to sink in without issue. Mentally shrugging it off, he sat up on the couch and stretched his arms before he popped his back. Rias backed away so he could stand up, watching him as he stretched the rest of his body before turning to her and shrugging. Do you feel any stronger? Even a pawn gets a boost in physique when they're reincarnated. Naruto looked thoughtful before he perked up and wrote his answer. Those markings on the piece might be limiting what I am capable of. It wouldn't make sense to give me all the perks if I might just decline taking this role full-time. That makes sense, 
I suppose, she relented. Well have to see what you're capable of later. You told me that you had a shift today, right? He nodded with a small smile. Go ahead and get to your job. We'll meet up later. He nodded again as his smile turned thankful. Waving her goodbye, he left the clubroom. As he left, Rhea spotted that he left something behind and moved to grab it. When she raised it up, she saw that it was a flash drive with a label of demos on it. She was torn whether or not to return it to him immediately, for her curiosity was growing on what he could have stored in the device. She reasoned to herself that she could give it to him when she saw him later, smiling to herself as she moved over to her laptop to take a listen. Sure, she felt a little guilty, but, she wanted to see the results of Naruto's musical dedication. Up in the realm of the angels, two siblings were currently conversing over something of major importance. Michael, is it really such a big deal? A beautiful blonde woman asked the current leader of heaven. Just because they were sealed away doesn't mean that their container will continue where they left off. Michael looked unsure, a worried frown on his face as he remembered the six siblings that the Heavenly Father ordered him to seal away into a sacred gear. They haven't shown up since they were sealed, and now their energy signature is coming from Kuo in Japan. The devils could influence the wielder into striking us. Gabriel looked downcast at that. Brother, we can't assume that the devils are so eager to start war once again. They had their own civil war to remove their old leaders, after all. And the new leaders want to foster peace as much as we do. I know, sister, but, I can't help but be cautious. That sacred gear, and those sisters, they could easily match a Longinus if they train their container well enough. I still think you're being overly paranoid about this, Gabriel insisted. If it makes you feel any better, it'll go down to Kuo when Zenovia and Irina head there in a few weeks. Will that ease your worries? Slightly, he conceded. However, I would like you to take a close look at the wielder and come to your own conclusion about if they will be a problem. Brother, she began, a rare frown on her face. Gabriel, please, Michael cut off, making her go silent. I don't like feeling this uneasy, and I need to make sure that our people will be safe, especially since father has passed. Both seraphs looked down at that, giving a silent prayer for their fallen creator. After a moment of silence, Gabriel stared at her brother with her frown still in place before she relented with a sigh. Very well, then, I do this under protest, though. The pout she gave at the end made Michael smile, its warmth making his sister slowly smile in return. With the plan decided, the female seraph left her brother's office so he could resume his work. After his shift, Naruto was seen in a separate dimension with the Occult Research Club. It was created by the Grimori family so that they may safely train their peerage and any overly destructive techniques or powers they have at their disposal. The realm had been modified to look like an open field with some trees and ruined buildings. Rias had Kiba and Kaneko work on Issei and Asia's physical training while she and Akino would see if Naruto had a sacred gear or something else that had been gifted to him by his blood. The peerage had been upfront with Naruto about what they could do, even telling him some facts that were a bit personal. One of those facts was how Kaneko was a yokai who had been reincarnated into Rias' rook. She was a rare form of the Nekomata race that were called Nekosho, one of the last two alive. Hearing this, Naruto gave them his thanks for their trust before he returned the favor, informing them of his siren blood. At first, they were confused as to how a siren, even if he was only one partially, could be mute, Issei going so far as to ask, albeit tactlessly. They would never forget the grief his false smile held when he wrote down the reason his mutism. It was after the reveal that Rias sent the others away, hoping to let Naruto compose himself while Issei thought about his less than stellar question. Okay, Naruto, Rias began, getting his attention. I'd like you to show us if there is something you could do. An evil piece is meant to bring out someone's potential, and I need to know if you already had an ability or gift that you could use before I made you a temporary devil. He nodded in understanding, motioning them to stand back and give him some space. Once they complied, he closed his eyes to focus, reaching down for the power he had trained with for many years. Two. He opened his eyes with a confused expression, looking around for the source of the strange voice. His actions concerned Rias and Akino, but they stood their ground off to the side. Focusing again, 
Naruto called upon his power and thrust his arm forward, fingers open and outstretched. From his hand, a gust of wind was launched and its power pushed against a tree in its path, knocking over many loose leaves and breaking weak branches. While Rias and Akino watched on with interest, Naruto frowned when the voice spoke up again. Na, Ru, too. His frown deepened as the voice seemed to whisper softly into his ear. Who are you? He thought to himself. We, wait, for, you, the voice answered, much to his surprise. He would have mentally asked another question, but Rias broke him away from his thoughts. So, you can control wind to an extent. Can you do anything else with it? Putting his thoughts on the mysterious voice aside for now, he nodded and raised his hand. The fingers were pressed together in a knife-hand fashion, and wind started to swirl around them. With a swipe, he sent a sharp blade of wind outwards, creating a trench in the ground and cutting cleanly through the tree he had targeted before. Era, Akino began, licking her lips. Impressive control, Uzumaki-kun. He turned bashful at the praise, scratching the back of his head with slightly flushed cheeks. Anything else? Rias asked, prompting him to write out a response. I can use the wind to sense my surroundings. When someone moves, it disturbs the air and I can feel it happening. It's like a sonar that is wind-based. That caught both of their interest. Let's test that, Rias prompted. Close your eyes and try to locate Akino as she moves around. Nodding, he closed his eyes and took a relaxed stance, missing how the air shifted around him. Rias and Akino saw and felt the shift, turning to watch how far the shifts traveled. When they finally stopped, Rias estimated the distance to be a little over 15 meters, roughly around 50 feet. Not a bad range, she mused before nodding to Akino. The queen brought out her wings and took to the sky, and Naruto raised a hand with a finger pointed after her. She moved around the sky, doing sharp turns and reversals of direction, but he kept up with her the whole time. A smirk came to her face, and she darted down to the ground at high speed. She changed her trajectory to aim directly at him from ground level, noticing his brow's furrow. His eyes shot open and he dive rolled to the side, avoiding her flying tackle as she lifted herself back into the air above him. He stopped his roll, taking a knee on the ground while giving her an annoyed look. I couldn't resist, she defended, giggling demurely as if she did nothing wrong. Dryly, Naruto held up his notepad with a single word written on it, sadist. Era, Uzumaki-kun has figured me out so easily, she praised in a teasing tone, giggling once more, this time with a slight blush. She's the ultimate sadist, actually, Rias informed Naruto, looking amused when he aimed his dry expression at her. Anyway, that sensory of yours is useful. If you could sense something coming, you could be better prepared for it. I bet that's how you knew I was approaching you the other day, huh? He scratched his whiskered cheek sheepishly, looking guilty. Anyway, I'll have Akino help you with refining your wind later. For now, I want to see if you have something called a sacred gear. He tilted his head questioningly. That gauntlet Issei has as an example. I felt a power coming from just below your neck, and I am wondering if it's a sacred gear or just your latent siren power. He frowned thoughtfully, unsure of what it could be. A siren drew power from their voice, and he lost his as a baby. It wouldn't make sense for him to have their power still within him. Deciding to get answers, he sat down on the ground and crossed his legs. Pressing his fists together on his lap, he closed his eyes and concentrated, searching within himself for anything other than his wind powers. Once again, the voice from before called to him, but they sounded further away than before. He frowned in his meditation before he focused entirely on the voice. Within his mind's eye, he saw a brilliant flash before he blacked out. Naruto, Rias called out in concern, seeing the blonde suddenly fall forward and land face first on the ground. She and Akino rushed over to him, trying to rouse him, but he wouldn't respond. Play my immortal by evanescence. The first thing Naruto registered when his senses returned to him was the sound of women singing. Slowly, his eyes opened and he saw flower petals floating around in a calm breeze, as if they danced to the somber song that was being sung. He roused himself to a sitting position, looking around to see a void decorated in pinkish-red lights similar to the northern lights. There were also dozens of green trees that were covered in blooming flowers, 
flowers that held white petals and pink cores. Getting to his feet, he focused his hearing on the melodious singing, walking to where he felt it was originating from. Walking past a seemingly limitless number of trees, his blue eyes admired the endless petals that floated around him. A serene smile formed on his lips, and he basked in the peaceful atmosphere that this void held. Walking over a small hill, he saw a stone altar with six women standing in a circle, all of them singing in perfect harmony. In the center of the altar was a massive stalk that had a city-sized flower that was in full bloom, the entire thing the same color of the trees and their flowers. He walked up the steps and found a piece of rubble to sit on, happily spectating their performance as he took in their features. The first woman was tall and had a figure that rivaled Rias and Akino. She had long and flowing blonde hair, amber eyes, and wore clothes that left very little to the imagination. On her forehead was the Roman numeral of the number five. The next woman had brown hair tied in twin pigtails and blue eyes. She was dressed more moderately than the first and had an air of self-dignity. On her forehead was the number four. Third was a woman with purple hair that was cut straight. Her eyes were a similar shade to her hair and she wore comfortable clothes with a buckler-styled shield on her left arm. Clipped to her belt were two pairs of scissors, and her forehead held the number three. The next had short and curly blue hair and matching eyes. Her clothes consisted of a bikini top, a skirt, and some stockings while a black flower with a blue core rested in her blue locks. On her forehead was the number two. Fifth in line had pale blonde hair in a bob style with a black headband holding back the thicker strands. Her eyes were wine red and she wore white clothes that looked modest and styled light cathedral clothes. Decorating those clothes were some armored gloves and a circle-shaped weapon that was strapped to her back. The number one was on her forehead. Finally, there was a woman with white hair and reddish pink eyes. She wore pristine white clothes with black heels, and had a prosthetic left arm with clawed fingers. Her forehead was bare, which confused Naruto since he thought there was a theme going on. End music. When they finished their song, they all turned to him. This prompted him to stand up, his hands clapping in appreciation for their harmony. The women with five and four smiled at his actions while the others remained stoic, more so than Kaneko. The one without a number beckoned him forward, and he complied without question, standing before the six of them. Welcome, Naruto. She greeted calmly, surprising him. Yes, I was the one who called you and brought you here. We've waited seventeen years to speak with you, though I had hoped you would be able to return the sentiment. He cringed at that, looking down sadly. Sister, for admonished, her expression stern. That was uncalled for. If he gets like this every time it's brought up, then there's more work to be done than I thought, she replied easily. It happened at his birth and he's coped without a voice for his entire life. He should be over it by now. He looked up and frowned at her, his blue orbs blazing. This only made her smirk. So, your name is justified. Good, I was worried you'd be too soft. One sighed and stepped forward. We're wasting time, he needs to be told who we are and why he's here. Mo, you're always so serious, complained Five, a pout on her face as she crossed her arms perking up her impressive bosom. Her pout became a smirk when Naruto blushed and avoided looking at her. And you're annoyingly cheery, three drawled out, cutting some split ends with her scissors. Naruto felt out of place during their sisterly squabble. He raised his arm to get their attention, something too noticed. Getting back on track, we're all within what is called a soulscape, Naruto-kun. He raised a brow in curiosity, prompting Four to continue. A soulscape is deep within your subconscious, in the deepest recesses of your soul and any hidden power within. It is where your siren powers rest, and where our sacred gear has awakened. He perked up at that, turning to the others as they nodded in confirmation. The six of us, one picked up, all make up this sacred gear, Naruto. But, we weren't always here. We used to have flesh and blood bodies and had hundreds of followers, three continued, satisfied with her hair management for now. We're known as intoners, goddesses with the power of song. What that means, one pressed forward, is that our songs give others strength, and they empower our demons, personal companions that are linked to us spiritually. However, Five continued, her pout returning, some stuck-up guy with angel wings sealed us away with the help of someone he called Father. 
They targeted us individually and erased our faith from history. Now, nobody knows about the intoner faith, about us. He regarded them sadly, feeling sympathy for them losing so much. A kinship was felt between himself and the six of them, one of loss and pain. The unmarked one he would refer to her as Zero finally spoke up again. Once they sealed us away, they changed our prison to the sacred gear that was born within you. And that sacred gear, now, they all spoke as one, is the Gale Symphony. As soon as they declared the title, the wind picked up and made the petals dance wildly. The title also resonated inside of Naruto, making him feel a strange sense of pride, but also, a sense of sadness. You felt it, didn't you? Zero asked, making him nod. Our souls have been linked, and they have been since you drew your first breath. You, Naruto, are the last link to our diminished faith, the last one to bear our power. However, for cut in, that power has changed, evolved in a way. You see, our power is song, but your power, she smiled to him and finished, your power goes beyond song. It is the wind, the natural power that carries our voices and reaches all over the world. It is why we have Gale in our name. He looked unsure of everything, not knowing how to respond and wishing he could speak. Five noticed he was uncomfortable and she stepped forward to place a hand on his shoulder. His blue eyes met her amber, and she gave him a smile to comfort him. We're standing with you, Naruto-kun. That's what you need to understand. All of us, four continued, stepping forward as well. We are your symphony. And you, three spoke up, stepping forward, are our gale. Two smiled and moved over to him, her hand covering fours on his other shoulder. We're all in this, together. We will help you grow stronger, one continued. Strong enough to show that we are not forgotten, that we still exist inside of you. But most importantly, Zero concluded, moving closer and standing directly in front of him with her hand pressed over his heart, we will be your voice. You will be our body. All for one. And one for all, he mouthed, a tearful smile on his face. He felt it from the hands they placed on him, the link they shared. The bond that resonated between all of their souls. Naruto Shippuden Ost. The road continues. Stepping back, he stuck out his hand with the palm down, his smile growing into a bright grin that dared to challenge the sun's luster. One by one, the intoners smiled back at him and placed their hands over his own, five through zero in perfect order. Once Zero had her hand placed, Naruto placed his other hand on hers, and the six women stilled as they felt their hearts pulse in perfect harmony. Slowly, Naruto began to fade away from the soulscape, his peaceful face being the last part of him to disappear. Once he was gone, Zero turned to her sisters and smirked. We chose well, was all she said, earning agreeing nods from the other intoners. They all then moved over to the giant flower, placing their hands on the stalk and sending their power through it. The bloom at the top gained a green aura, drops of pure light raining from its petals and washing over them. They would stand with him, just as he would stand for them. End music. When Naruto came to, he sat up slowly and saw that the wind was raging around him. Strangely, everything had a green coloration to it and he felt like his ears were covered by muffs or pads. Getting to his feet, he saw the wind slowly die down until they faded away, letting the others approach him safely. Naruto, Rias called as she and the others rushed over to him. Her eyes widened when she saw something new about him, gasping out, S sacred gear, you do have one. All he did was grin with pride, his green eyes regarding them all happily before they faded back to blue. A couple of days passed after Naruto awakened the Gale Symphony and met the intoners. Turns out, the titles he gave them were correct since they each were named after the number they bore. While they were okay with their names, Naruto felt that being called by a number was an insult to what they used to be. If they were really goddesses that had been sealed away, then they needed actual names, not numerical titles. He promised them to give them names when he thought of them, something that warmed their hearts as he proved, once again, that they had chosen well. Currently, Naruto was rushing back to Kuo Academy, still dressed in his ramen stand uniform, complete with stained apron. Rias had told him that there would be a meeting today between herself and someone important, though, she looked spiteful at referring to the person in that manner. Whoever it was that Rias was going to speak with, 
they were not someone she liked, that much was obvious. Rushing through the entrance to the school grounds, he unconsciously used his sacred gear to have the wind blow at his back, increasing his speed so that he almost blurred to the door. Pushing it open with his momentum, he stumbled slightly as he entered the clubroom before he righted himself, looking embarrassed at his entrance and giving Rias an apologetic look. He then took note of the two new people that he had never seen before. The first was a woman with silver hair and eyes, dressed in a stereotypical maid's uniform that strangely looked great on her. He hoped that Jiraiya's perverted tendencies hadn't somehow rubbed off on him before his death, because he felt that his thoughts would be something the super pervert would think. The other person was seated on the same couch as Rias, something Naruto noticed made her tense and annoyed. That alone made Naruto deduce that the blonde man was the person Rias was meant to speak with. He wore a burgundy blazer and matching pants with a white shirt that wasn't buttoned up all the way. Just looking at the guy made Naruto feel a sense of ire, for the man regarded him with disinterest and a slight sneer. Who is this human who thinks he can barge in on this meeting? He asked in annoyance. That is my newest club member, Rias answered calmly. He's testing out a temporary evil piece that Lord Beelzebub made for me. Ah, he replied, his expression once again taking on little interest, I remember father telling me that Lord Lucifer finally contributed to your little rebel streak. But honestly, this was what you wasted a prototype piece on, a lowly human who looks like he works in the slums. Naruto bristled silently, and he felt the intoner's growing ire from within him. Who the hell is this jackass? Issei growled out, having come to see Naruto as a cool guy during the few days he had spent with Rias Peerage. Alongside him, the other Peerage members also held small frowns at the insult to their companion. Seated next to Lady Rias is Lord Riser of House Phoenix, informed Grafia calmly. He is Lady Rias' fiancé due to a contract between the Grimori and Phoenix houses. Riser smirked at the introduction his face showing one of superiority to the others, Issei and Naruto, specifically. Then, the man flexed his power and called forth a large magic circle with his family crest on it. From that circle came a group of women who stood behind Riser obediently while one of them took a seat on the couch beside him. And those women are his peerage, Grafia continued before gesturing to the girl who sat down. Along with his younger sister, Lady Ravel Phoenix. So, Riser cut in as soon as the introductions were finished, where was this pitiful waste anyway? I would have thought that a servant of my Rias would have been more punctual. Irritably, Naruto gestured to his stained uniform before reaching into his pocket and pulling out a flyer with the Grimori crest on it. He then slammed it on the table in front of everyone, glaring at Riser. Ah, Grafia spoke up, I see. You were late and are in such a state due to fulfilling your obligations not one to shirk your responsibilities for any reason. The maid nodded, her tone showing a slight approval towards his actions. Ha, huh, he's just a mere scullion. How pathetic. Truly my Rias, Riser is shocked and disappointed that such a pathetic dreg is one of your servants. Riser said, addressing himself in the third person. I fail to see his commitment to his duties as something to scoff at, Riser Sama, the silver-haired maid said, eyes narrowed dangerously. He fulfilled his task and rushed right back here immediately afterwards. I was unaware the House of Phoenix looked down on those who take their obligations seriously. Rias winced, knowing that her elder sister-in-law Grafia, someone born to the House of Lucifuge, a noble family of pure-blooded devils from the extra demons who were proud of their commitments and loyalties, would take any negative comments against a hard worker personally. Riser gulped, and so did Ravel, both Phoenix members feeling the tense atmosphere. The rest of the unfamiliar girls glared at the maid, but she turned to them and merely rose a brow. That small gesture was all it took and they shrank away from her, dropping their glares and cowering. Naruto blinked, who was this woman dressed like a maid, and why were these people so afraid of her? My apologies for the display and the lack of consideration, she said, speaking to Naruto. Had I known of any prior duties, I would have seen this meeting occur later. Grafia then turned and bowed slightly to Naruto while also giving him a minute smile. It pleased her to see Rias' probationary piece was dedicated to his employer and to Rias. He blushed at her actions and nervously waved her off. He didn't mean to gather so much attention, and it wasn't this woman's fault he was late. Why Lord Lucifer finally contributed to your little rebel streak, 
and why Lord Beelzebub would waste such an important prototype piece on something as pathetic as this is beyond Riser, Riser said, still speaking in third person. Unless of course this miserable dreg is expendable, which explains everything, actually. Riser's even betting that his parents were lowborn trash like he is, scraping just to get by and then dying pathetically in some matter. He gave a condescending smirk and chuckle as Naruto trembled in pure rage. Such is the sad, pathetic lives of these lowly creatures. Within the Gale Symphony, the intoners heard Riser's insult to their host's family. Needless to say, they weren't pleased. What did that bastard just say? Two yelled out furiously. Why, that little shit. Three added, gripping her scissors dangerously tight. How dare he say such things? Four trembled in anger, her normally composed nature unable to stay strong. He's a dead man. Second comes the death, but first comes exposing he has that many girls with him to try making up for his subatomic sized beat. Five promised, her amber eyes flashing dangerously. Oh, one began, cracking her armored knuckles, it's going to be a pleasure ripping his head out of his ass. No wonder that Grimori girl doesn't want to marry him. I don't blame her. Zero was silent as her sisters raged, stewing over the insult to her chosen vessel. Of all the death and suffering ever caused with our power, she began, her voice dangerously soft, freeing that redhead from this fucking swine is one I am going to treasure inflicting most. I sincerely hope that this house of Phoenix doesn't mind losing an heir, because this son of a bitch just crossed the line by insulting Naruto's family. She then gave a grin brimming with bloodlust that demanded to be nourished. It was a look her sisters had seen before they were all sealed away, a look that still sent chills down their spines. I actually feel somewhat indebted to those feathered, sanctimonious beep talkers that ruined everything when it was supposed to be over, she continued, referring to the angels that sealed them into the Gale Symphony. If it weren't for them sticking us in here, we wouldn't be getting to butcher this pompous child and his group of sluts. Shuddering as their rage echoed within his mind, Naruto put a hand to his head as it started throbbing. Oh good, they were pissed. While he could do without the headache, it was still nice to know that his new partners cared so much about him. Rias bolted to her feet and rounded on her would-be fiancé. Riser, how dare you, she snarled as her eyes glowed red and black energy with a red outline danced around her dangerously. She could try tolerating Riser being an arrogant womanizer, for she had known he was for many years, now, but insulting her peerage, even if Naruto wasn't a fully accepted member, was going too far for her to forgive. Worse still, it was an insult aimed at a friend's deceased family. The third son of the Phoenix clan merely stood up with his condescending smirk and grabbed Rias by her chin. You will need that willful streak beaten out of you, my dear Rias, he said firmly, his tone turning dangerous. He was unprepared for a distortion in the air to appear around his arm before his hand was separated from his body, a clean cut through the wrist. Furious, he turned to glare at the one responsible and saw it was the same lowborn brat he had just insulted. Naruto was glaring at Riser, breathing hard like a winded bull. But what really surprised everyone was that his eyes were no longer blue. Instead, they were glowing green and wind was swirling around him. For a moment, Rias worried he might attack Riser, which wouldn't help the situation. However, he suddenly winced and grabbed his head, falling to a knee as he felt the intoners start to bicker within his mind. Zero, stop, one yelled, her arms wrapped around the eldest sister. She tried to pull Zero away from the center stock that represented the core of the Gale Symphony. One, Zero started, growling as she spoke, if you know what's good for you, you'll. Zero, please. Not like this, Four urged as she helped one pull her away. You're willing to do whatever you must and cross any line you want in the name of obligation and responsibility. One continued, as much as we are complete opposites, and as much as I considered you as a traitor to the intoners, she paused briefly, getting Zero's attention, I understood and respected that about you and the reasons why you turned on us, even when you almost cut us all down back then. But this isn't the way and you know it. He deserves punishment compounded in blood. Zero argued, her tone demanding retribution. And I mean gallons of it. And we agree. Two tried to reason, but not here, at least. It's too private for his execution. Three supported, staring down her older sister. Wait for a more fitting moment, five added, smirking deviously. When the time is right, 
Well I'll help Naruto-kun put that child in his place. Zero went silent, contemplating everything her sister said. Hey, she finally relented, a smirk returning to her face. Finally, something we can all completely agree on, besides Naruto being the perfect container. And you all make a great point, this bastard peacock deserves to die before the eyes of all the world. It'll be patient, for now, she promised, pulling back her power and influence. Naruto gasped as Zero's influence on his mind retracted, but he kept his glare aimed at Rias' obviously unwanted fiancé. He wasn't going to forget a thing this bastard said or did for a long time. Riser snarled response, even as he grabbed his arm and placed the ends of the injury together. A quick flash of fire came from them, healing the wound and reattaching his hand while flames erupted threateningly from his fingertips. Enough, a stern voice cut in, making all attention focus on the wife of Lucifer. This isn't why we're all gathered here, she declared, causing Riser to dispel his flames while Naruto's eyes faded back to blue and the wind ceased. After they both had their respective elements dissipate, Riser clicked his teeth in annoyance. Indeed, he agreed with Graphia, trying to save face. Such low-born trash is of no consequence, especially since my Rias and I need to prepare for our wedding. Rias glared at the man she was going to be forced to marry with undisguised disgust. I refuse, I have no intention of bringing my family to ruin, but I will not allow such insults against those that serve and aid me to stand unchallenged. That would dishonor my family in an even worse way. This pact between our houses was just proven a farce by that spiteful arrogance of yours and I will not be part of it. So, you mean to settle this dispute in a raiding game, then, my beloved Rias? Riser questioned her with an arrogant smirk. The redhead nodded firmly, her eyes blazing. Gladly. At her words, the Phoenix laughed. Very well, then, I'll accept this challenge, if only to show you how pointless your rebellious nature is. I'll even give you ten days to prepare your peerage for the game. He then gave her a wicked grin, licking his lips hungrily. And when you lose, my beloved, you'll have to accept our marriage without complaint. With that, Riser gave Graphia a faint nod before he and his all-female peerage vanished in a magic circle bearing the Phoenix family crest. As soon as they were gone, Issei raged out, who the hell does that fucker think he is? Indeed, Kiba agreed with a rare frown on his face. Such insults aimed at a member of our club, at a comrade, will not be taken lightly. Fried yakitori on the menu, Kaneko added, her brows furrowed even as she spoke stoically. Asia fiddled with her uniform before she moved over to her fellow blonde. Naruto-san, will you be okay? He turned to her and met her concerned green eyes with his angered blue. Seeing as it wouldn't be fair to give her such a look, he forced himself to calm down and gave her a weak smile, nodding once. She didn't look convinced, but she accepted the nod and embraced him to show her support. Normally, Issei would have been rather jealous of such an act, but he knew that Naruto needed the support of his friends after hearing insults about his late family. So, he said nothing and just turned to Rias. Ten days to train, I say we get started right now, Bushu. Rias nodded with a faint smile. And we will. I just need to speak with Sona for a moment before we leave. She then turned back to Graphia and handed her a file that was on her desk. This is for Lord Beelzebub. It's what I've noticed so far about the probation piece he lent me. The maid took the file and stored it away in a pocket dimension before speaking to her husband's sibling. A word of advice, Lady Rias. Riser may have deplorable conduct and unwarranted pride, but he will not be an easy mountain for you and your peerage to climb. You must give it everything you have and beyond. I know, the young Grimori assured her sister-on-law. Although, I am surprised you're giving me advice at all, considering how by the book you prefer to be. Offering Rias a smile, Graphia replied, I make exceptions at times, when it comes to my family. The two shared a brief hug before the maid left the clubroom. Rias then turned to her peerage and declared, Well start our training tonight. Gather a week's worth of clothes and necessities and meet back here in three hours. Yes, Bushu, the others replied while Naruto nodded. Naruto, Rias called, making him stop from leaving, I have something for you. The others left the clubroom while Naruto moved over to her. Pulling out his flash drive, she smiled at the surprised look he had on his face. 
I hope you don't mind if I listen to your demos, but you left this here the other day. I guess it probably fell out of your bag. He looked embarrassed at misplacing it and at Rias admitting she listened to them. Shuffling his feet, he gave her an anxious expression and silently asked her opinion. Knowing what he was asking, she kept her smile and answered, Your demos were great, Naruto. I think that they are fine the way they are, especially the one titled The Journey. 1. He rubbed the back of his head bashfully, his cheeks flushed once again in embarrassment. Keep up the progress, Naruto. I can't wait to listen to your CD when you finish it, especially with all the effort you've put into it. He gave her a grin in response and nodded, silently promising that he wouldn't stop working hard. Giving her a wave goodbye, he left her alone in the clubroom as he headed home to pack. With no one around, Rias scowled at nothing and declared aloud, Riser, you're going down. Of course, you can take time off, Chuki told his blonde employee, smiling warmly at the young man. You've put plenty of time here while going to school and working on your music. I don't see a problem giving you a break. Thanks, Naruto signed to him. I should be gone for about two weeks. Take some time to rest, too, his co-worker almost ordered him. Ayame was always looking out for him ever since he started working for her and her father. You've looked pretty drained these past few days, so, use this time off to relax. He smiled at her concern and nodded once. I will, he promised before he bid them goodbye. Heading back to the school, he adjusted the duffel bag that was hanging on his shoulder as he enjoyed the late afternoon breeze. During these ten days, we'll be training you in using our weaponry, Zero informed him from the mental link he and the intoners shared. I use all of them, but the others specialize in different weapons. What do they use? He asked back. I use chakrams, or bladed discus weapons, one answered. I use swords as my weapon, two continued. My scissors, three spoke up. But those can translate to daggers or knives for you. I use hand to hand but I usually wear combat bracers, four stated. And I use spears, five finished. Naruto gained a thoughtful expression at the variety of weapons he was supposed to train in. How am I going to carry those weapons into the raiding game? Kiba could lend me a sword with his sacred gear, and I could fight bare-handed, but what about the others? Don't worry, by the time we're finished with you, you'll be a walking armory, Zero assured him, and he could practically feel the smirk she was giving him. For now, just listen to that girl and get better acquainted with your temporary peace. But, I haven't felt any difference since Rias put the peace into me. I don't feel stronger, I don't feel weaker in sunlight, and I even tried to read part of the Bible online the other day. The intoners looked to one another, all but one of them at a loss at what to do. However, Zero's smirk became a small grin at hearing everything he had said. Naruto, do me a favor and buy some empty vials. Why? He asked in confusion. I've got an idea, was all she said in response, but it still made a shiver crawl up his spine. Rias sat calmly at her desk, waiting for the last member of her group to arrive. Naruto was running a little late, but she didn't see any harm in it. He lived pretty far from the school, and he couldn't access devil magic because of the restrictions on the probationary peace. From what she and Naruto had recorded throughout his time possessing the peace, it seemed as though the brandings that Ajuka Beelzebub placed on it had the pawn act as nothing more than a title. In layman's terms, Naruto was only a devil in name, nothing more. He couldn't summon his wings, couldn't access magic, didn't get a boost in physique, and wasn't affected by elements that naturally weakened newly made devils, like sunlight. Hopefully, the Satan who created the peace would lower the restrictions if he decided to continue making probation pieces. They were meant to let others experience what being a devil entailed without immediate agreement, after all. She was brought out of her musing by Naruto entering the clubroom with an apologetic expression. With a smile, she waved off his apologies and gestured for him to take a seat. When he took a spot next to Akino, who looked pleased by his actions, Rias addressed her peerage. We'll be spending the next ten days at one of my family's summer homes here in Japan. It's secluded enough so that we won't be disturbed by anyone who doesn't know of it. Not that I don't doubt our chances, Issei spoke up nervously, but do we have enough members to take on a full peerage? Quality over quantity, Issei-kun, Kiba replied with a reassuring smile. 
We just need to focus on improving ourselves. Kiba is right, Issei, Rias continued. They may have more members, but I doubt they'll be expecting us to put up much of a fight, which gives us the advantage. Underestimation, Kaneko simplified for the perverted pawn. Issei hummed in thought before nodding. I think I get it. We get them to lower their guard, which lets us take care of them quickly. Era, I can't wait to see their shock when they realize their error in judgment, Akino mused wistfully, giggling in growing excitement. Oh, the looks of utter despair and agony as we. Anyways, Rias cut off loudly, preventing Akino from going into detail. Sometimes, her sadism got out of hand. I'll have Kiba and Kaneko help you in Asia in your physical training, Issei. Then, Akino and I will help you both get a better understanding of devil magic. But, what about Naruto-san? Asia asked in concern. Naruto simply smiled and handed her his notepad. I'll be refining my wind power with Akino-senpei when she isn't helping you or Issei. There are also some things that I want to try out with my sacred gear. That reminds me, what's yours called? Issei asked, I have the boosted gear and Asia Chan has twilight healing. Gale Symphony, it's a wind and sound based sacred gear. That's disturbingly fitting since you like music so much, he replied after reading Naruto's response. It's almost like your gear was made for you. He's not too far off, actually, one spoke up in Naruto's head, her voice sprinkled with slight amusement. All right, let's get going. Rias declared as she summoned a large magic circle that encompassed the entire floor. In a flash of red light, they all left Kuo and arrived in a large parlor that looked ready to entertain several guests. Okay, the rooms are down the hall. Go ahead and pick one for yourself so you could drop off your things. Afterwards, wait for me back in here. Nodding their understanding, the members of the orc left to pick their rooms for their 10 day stay. It was time to get to work. Okay. Since you can't use our magic or wings, we need to figure out alternatives to help you during the raiding game, Rias said to Naruto as she paced in front of him. Currently, she had Akino teaching Asia basic magic while Kaneko and Kiba physically trained Issei. I have an idea that I'd like you to try. He tilted his head and waved for her to continue. I saw this in one of my manga, and it involved someone who also had wind-based power. What I want you to try and do is create a solid platform of wind that you could stand on in midair. This could help counter any of Riser's pieces who may try to get an aerial advantage over you. Not a bad idea, actually, Five mused. Nodding in understanding, Naruto took a breath to concentrate before he leapt as high as he could. At the peak of his jump, he thrust a hand downward and sent out a gust of wind that pushed him higher into the air with its recoil. His eyes slowly turned green as he put more focus into the hand-releasing wind, picturing the air solidifying beneath him into a circular platform. Rias floated near him with her wings, ready to help him if this attempt failed. Her blue-green eyes looked beneath him, watching as the air shifted and swirled within an oval-shaped boundary. The winds within the boundary were trapped and held together as Naruto's feet approached them in his descent, and she readied herself to catch him just in case. When his feet made contact, the platform held for a moment before Naruto lost concentration as he tried to keep his balance. With the platform destabilized, Rias flew over to him and caught him with his arm over her shoulders, earning her a thankful look from the blonde for the help. Well, it's a start, she mused aloud as she landed them both safely. You made a good attempt, but next time try to make the platform lower so that you're not so high in the air. He gave her a nod in understanding. Well keep working on that later. For now, I want to know what you plan to do to train your sacred gear. Pulling out his notepad, he wrote down his training plans before handing it to her. I wanted to try and shape wind into a close-ranged attack that bursts outwards when it hits someone. I also wanted to see what other shapes I can turn wind into. Good ideas, she complimented. For the first one, maybe have the shape fit into your hand, like a ball or something similar. For the other, you could maybe try to create a sword or something out of wind. That's what I was going to have you try so you could train in our weaponry, Zero spoke up. Good to see that she's on the same track as we are. Naruto grinned at that, nodding both to Rias and to Zero, not that Rias knew. She smiled back and held up her hand with the palm upwards. Within it, she generated a sphere of black energy that held a fierce red outline, 
easily keeping it stable in her palm. This is my power of destruction. It was hard for me to get a handle on at first, but now I can control it like this with ease. She watched him study it closely, holding up his own palm. Take in the air around you, she instructed, watching as it began to swirl towards his hand, and contain it within a ball shape so that it continuously twists and turns. This way, the power inside will keep growing stronger since it will act like a compacted hurricane. His brows furrowed as he concentrated on the wind in his hand. Gritting his teeth, he put his left hand over the wind so that both of his hands cupped it into a crude sphere. Before their eyes, the wind created a thick shell that contained the churning air within. Looking ahead, Naruto took aim at a tree in front of him before he charged it, his left hand keeping the air churning within his right palm. Within the Gale Symphony, the intoners watched as Naruto thrust the spiraling sphere of raging wind into the tree. As soon as it made contact, it began to grind away at the bark before it destabilized and burst against the tree. Due to it being wind under his current control, Naruto had been able to direct the impending burst so that there wasn't any backlash against his hand. And the result was the tree shattering under the pressure of the wind, which continued to travel forward as an enlarged sphere that barreled through many more trees before finally dispersing. Two sets of eyes widened as they say the path of destruction that had just been made, amazed at the power behind it. You unreal, Rias gasped out. I only gave you the idea, but, you took way beyond what I thought you would. Naruto didn't appear to hear her, holding his right hand before his eyes and clenching it a few times. To Rias, it looked like Naruto was barely coming to terms with what he was capable of. She was in the same boat, and it excited her beyond measure. If a simple suggestion led to that, then who knew what else Naruto had at his disposal? With the intoners, they were all smiling or smirking with pride for their partner. That'll make some heads roll for sure, Five commented. Definitely, and to think hell only improve from here on, Four continued. Three chuckled disturbingly, think of what that will do to that bastard who insulted his family. I doubt we even need to think, Two replied proudly. Nice job, Naruto-kun. I wonder if he could make that into a ranged attack as well, one mused. Zero simply smirked in silence, not needing to say anything to show her pride in Naruto. Three days had passed since the day Naruto successfully made that devastating wind attack. Out of curiosity, Rias asked him if he was going to name the technique and a name came to him in a dream. In the dream, he saw himself and Jiraiya, the both of them dressed differently than he was used to. Jiraiya was teaching him the very technique he made, except it was made from an energy that he didn't hear the name of. However, he did hear that it was called the Rasengan. So, he decided to stick with that, liking how it sounded. The intoners also enjoyed seeing the wind technique and they brought up one's notion of making it a ranged attack as well. That was something Naruto was interested in trying, but he wasn't sure if he had the time to try it out, considering what he already had on his plate in terms of training. Currently, Naruto was standing unsteadily on a wind platform that he had successfully made thanks to Akino giving him some advice. She was more adept in magic than Rias, so her opinion was greatly valued on this endeavor. He was trying to move around while maintaining the platform, allowing him to take part in mid-air combat. Faster, Rias ordered as she had him practice dodging on his platform, sending weak fireballs at him with her magic. She winced when she saw one get a bit too close, only being avoided by a wobbly shift in stance on Naruto's part. Still, she didn't let up, for he had asked her not to go too easy on him. Keep your focus, Naruto. Dodge. She unleashed a trio of fireballs that he evaded. The first was dodged by him ducking under it, the second with a strafing shift of his platform, and the last by leaping over it with a near split of his legs before he landed on his platform once more without falling through it like the times before. He looked surprised at the success before grinning brightly. Standing up to his full height, he wiped the sweat from his brow and had his control over wind make the platform move around, as if it were gliding through the air. He stood calmly, not getting too emotional or overzealous as he willed the platform to move, ascend, and descend at slowly increasing speeds. Rias saw him executing this and smiled proudly pleased to see that their training was bearing great fruit. Next, she would have him practice attacking and defending while maintaining his platform. On the night of the fifth day, 
Naruto was seen in the parlor of the Grimori summer home. He was smiling contently as he cleaned off the dusty instruments that were on a stage. There were violins, basses, guitars, trumpets, drums, a piano, flutes, and various other instruments all placed together for the sole purpose of entertaining the audience. Currently, he was wiping some wood polish on a guitar before he would clean the strings and tune it. I thought I'd find you here, he heard Rhea speak up. He turned to her and offered her a smile in greeting before he gestured to the instruments he had already cleaned. Yes, I can see you've been busy, despite me telling you to rest. He rubbed the back of his head sheepishly at her accusation before he finished cleaning the strings. Sitting with his legs crossed, he rested the guitar across his lap and began to tune it, frowning at how it hadn't been tuned in possibly months. Hey, Rhea spoke up again, softer than before. When she had his attention again, she looked to the side awkwardly and asked, Can you, play something for me? He blinked at the question, not having expected that. When she looked back to him, he pointed to the piano on stage, something she shook her head negatively to. No, play that, she answered, pointing to the guitar in his lap. I want to listen to you play something that's special to you. He looked to the guitar, holding it gentler than he had been beforehand. Raising his head to meet her gaze, he smiled faintly and nodded once before holding up a finger for her to give him a moment. She sat across from him and waited for him to finish his tuning and listened to him take a few practice strums before nodding in satisfaction. Play Tuesday's Child by Jesse Cook. And so, he began to play, and Rias immediately saw him drown himself in the rhythm the guitar made. His eyes were closed serenely, and he swayed his head to the music that began to echo throughout the parlor. She felt the wind pick up around him at some point, moving around the instruments and gently gliding across one of the violins to add a soft undertone that blended perfectly with the guitar. Her own eyes closed as she tried to immerse herself in the sounds and melody like he did so easily, but it was easier said than done. Her imagination started to draw up an image of a summer sky, with a gentle breeze that pushed clouds slowly. The clouds began to mix and phase through one another, starting off as shapeless masses of air and water before ending in random images that she enjoyed. She saw one shaped like an arrow, one shaped like a fox head, and another shaped like a blooming flower. And just when she felt herself falling deeper into the spell of his music. Stop music, he slowly ended the melody, finishing the song with a soft strum of the guitar strings. He smiled as he finished, his eyes still closed in peaceful content, a piece that his siren blood yearned for. Rias opened her eyes and watched as he just sat there, smiling softly before a stray tear fell down his cheek, dripping onto the guitar from the bottom of his chin. Concerned, she reached over and cupped the cheek that once held the tear, prompting Naruto to open his eyes and meet her gaze. She was taken aback by the warmth they held, and she felt her heart skip a few beats while her cheeks began to grow pink. He gave an awkward smile, scratching the cheek she wasn't touching before he made to grab his notebook. However, she stopped him by grabbing his hand with her free one. He met her gaze once more and saw her lean in close. This time, he was the one with flushed cheeks as she closed the remaining distance and gently pressed her lips to his. It was a simple peck, lasting less than a few seconds before she pulled back. She gave him a smile and said nothing, but there was something that was silently exchanged between their eyes. And slowly, he smiled back feeling truly happy for the first time in many years. A few more days passed and Rhea's group found themselves on the final day. Currently, the Grimori heiress was personally testing Issei and Asia on what they had learned. Akino was there to help judge while Kiba trained with Kaneko, her power and defense being a good opposition to his speed. As for Naruto, he was practicing with a pair of bladed discs made entirely out of wind. He was tossing them one at a time before he spun in place and released them both, having them move in a rapid circle that started close to him before expanding outwards in diameter about nine feet. Once they hit the nine-foot mark, they returned to him where he caught them with ease. Spear. Five called out, prompting Naruto to bring his wind chakrams close to him before he smashed them together and stretched his arms apart, reshaping the wind into a long handle with a drilling point on one end. Twirling the new spear. He gave out wide swings of the tip and sent forth crescent slashes of air pressure that gouged into the trees that surrounded him. He then cocked the spear and charged a large rock before stabbing it, 
the wind being so sharp that it pierced through it and poked out from the other side. Knives. Three ordered, and Naruto complied by regripping the spear at its center shaft and ripping it in two. The two pieces then shrunk and took the shape of curved daggers that he readjusted in his hands. In his right hand, it was held in a forward grip while the left hand held its dagger in a reverse grip. With a mix of slashes, thrusts, and kicks, Naruto attacked another tree with a razor fury before he backflipped away and threw the left dagger at it, piercing through it and stabbing tree behind it before it dispersed. Sword. Two cried, and the dagger in Naruto's right hand elongated into a katana shape that he held with both hands. With practiced swings, he sliced through one tree and cut deeply into the rock he had speared before, the wind producing a horrible grinding sound as it sliced deeply into the rough surface. He then spun in place and took a rising slash against another tree, this one small enough for him to cleanly bisect as he flipped once more and landed back on his feet, stumbling briefly before quickly righting himself. Bracers. Four yelled, and the sword dispersed in his hands before it regrouped around his forearms and shins. He took a few practice punches against nothing before he twisted in place and aimed a reverse punch at the rock he had damaged earlier. Putting all of his force into the punch, he rammed his wind-covered fist over the hole the spear had made before. The power behind it rammed against the rock and his arm sank into it up to his elbow before he expulsed the wind and shattered it completely, rubble flying all over where he was training. Stepping away, he took multiple deep breaths as a proudly tired smile etched itself onto his face. Excellent work, Zero praised. Now, it's time to practice our trump card against that prick. Naruto frowned at the mention of the bastard who insulted his late family. Say what you want to about him, laugh at his disability, or even criticize his music, he didn't care. However, speaking poorly about his family, about those he had loved dearly and lost. Then there was no mercy for you, none. With a firm nod, Naruto turned his attention to the lake that was near the summer home. Determination burned within his eyes as he headed towards it, ready to practice the technique that would take Riser down. It was only a matter of time, now, and the intoners and he all knew that. Rias sighed as she deposited the Uzumaki onto his bed, using her enhanced strength to easily carry him from the lake back to the house into his room. He was passed out from training himself to exhaustion, and yet he had a proud smile on his face. She smiled softly at him as he rested, moving the covers over him to make him more comfortable. Turning around, she was about to leave the room before she stopped at the door. A compulsion flowed through her, and she looked over her shoulder back at his sleeping form. Mentally deciding to screw everything else, she walked back over to his bed and pulled back the covers so that she could lay down beside him. Shifting herself so that she had her head resting on his chest, she smiled once more as she felt herself get comfortable. She was about to close her eyes to sleep before she blushed at seeing him pull her closer to him, still dead asleep and acting solely on instinct. She watched his peaceful expression and smiled yet again before gently pecking him beneath his chin and closing her eyes. That night, both of them slept better than they had in a long time, all worries, concerns, or doubts miles away from their thoughts. Naruto woke up the following morning to the feel of something warm curled against his body. Blinking the sleep out of his eyes, he looked over and saw a familiar shroud of red hair resting atop his chest. His cheeks grew red and he awkwardly reached over the arm Rias wasn't grabbing to gently shake her by the shoulder. She gave something akin to a whine at that, having one of her arms let go of his to swat away the offending disturbance. It's too early, she mumbled. Sighing at that, Naruto resorted to flicking her nose, making her recoil on reflex and scrunch her nose. She gave him a pout, and he gave her an apologetic expression in response. Seeing as he couldn't write anything, and she didn't understand sign language, he settled for pointing at the morning sun peeking out the window curtains. Oh, she replied, looking slightly downcast at that. Right, today's the big day, isn't it? He nodded with a sad smile. What do you think our chances are? I want to know your honest opinion about it. His brows furrowed at that, thinking of how to answer her question. Based solely on her tone, he could see that she was anxious about the event and the nerves were making her have doubts. She needed reassurance, something that he was willing to give her. So, he reached a hand over with his pointer and middle fingers stretched outward. Without warning, he gently poked her on the forehead, 
prompting her to rub the spot. She gave him a confused look, only to see him give her a grin wide enough to stretch his whiskered cheeks. Absently, she was once again reminded of Kitsun Yokai when she witnessed that expression. She slowly smiled back at him, understanding the message he was giving her. You're right, she stated. It won't do us any good to worry about it before it happens. We might bring down our own confidence. He nodded firmly, giving her a corny thumbs up that she couldn't help giggling at. With that concern dealt with, they both got ready for the day, Rias leaving for her room to give Naruto some privacy. In the sense of team spirit, Rias had her peerage wear their school uniforms save for Akino and Asia. Akino wore a Miko uniform that looked wonderful on her, and Asia wore her stitched up nun clothes. Devil or not, she still felt that connection to the church, something that Rias respected, despite how it went against devil culture. Issei and Kiba wore their uniforms with slight alterations. Issei left out the blazer and tie, finding them to be restricting while Kiba felt the same about only the blazer. As for Naruto, he left out the blazer, wore an orange undershirt, and simply loosened up his tie so that it didn't choke him. However, he added two new things to his attire. The first was the necklace that belonged to his grandmother Tsunade, who inherited it from her grandfather. It was a simple green gem that was held together by a durable cord around his neck. And the second addition was a black headband with an orange swirl insignia on it. According to his mother, the Uzumaki were a recognized family for the sirens. They weren't known as royalty, but they were respected. Their insignia was a red swirl, but Naruto chose orange to tribute his parents, more specifically, their hair. Are we ready? Rias asked her peerage, earning nods from them. She gave them a smile and added, Thank you all for helping me with this. I know that I could just demand your assistance as your king, but I wanted you all to help me as your choice. Era, don't get so emotional, Bushu. You know we support you, Akino replied. Indeed, after all, you are more than our king, you're our friend, Kiba spoke up. We have your back, Kaneko added, giving a rare smile to Rias. Yeah, well, do this together, Issei declared clenching his left fist in determination. Asia smiled with her hands rested over her chest, as if in prayer. You've done so much for me when you didn't need to. I've never had friends before, and I don't want to lose them when I've finally attained them. Naruto simply gave Rias another thumbs up, shouldering a guitar to his back. Rias looked curious about that, but she caught the amused face of Akino and held back her question. That alone let her know that her queen had a hand in this. A magical circle appeared on the floor beside them, revealing Grafia to the group once more. It's time, Lady Rias. Nodding, the Grimori heiress had her peerage gather around her so that the Queen of Lucifer could take them to the raiding game. Lord Azazel, I've got my report on that boy you wanted me to keep an eye on, a cloaked fallen spoke to the governor of the Grigori. Said governor merely looked up from the morning's newspaper, accepting the report from his subordinate. Anything worth noting before I read it? He's been recently working alongside the Grimori heiress, sir. I assume she's reincarnated him as a devil of her peerage. Well, my brother won't be pleased to hear that, Azazel noted in amusement. Especially after all the trouble he and father went through. Sir, the scout asked in confusion. Nothing to concern yourself about. It's something beyond your payroll, the man joked, earning a sweat drop from his scout. Oh, of course. Sir, he cleared his throat and added, he's shown an incredible aptitude for wind, most likely from a sacred gear. Azazel merely hummed at that, already knowing the origins of the power. Memories nearly forgotten resurfaced and he chuckled to himself. Anything else? Thanks to you suppressing my energy before the mission, I was able to get close enough to overhear talk of a raiding game, sir. Really? The ex-Seraph queried, his tone one of interest before he moved over to his television set. In his hand, a magical array appeared, and he raised it to the side of his head like a cell phone. Sirzex, he greeted jovially. Sorry for the unexpected call, but would you mind telling me what station your sister's game is being broadcasted on? He ignored the surprised look on his scout's face at how he had casually called the current Lucifer, focusing on said Satan's response. Yes, I promise to meet with you some time after the game. There are things we need to speak about, after all. Thanks, he bid before dispelling the communication spell. 
He then placed the same hand on his television, surging his power through it briefly before it flickered on and showed an empty space. Yes, sir. The scout stuttered out, feeling very out of place at the moment. Why don't you take a few days off to relax? The governor suggested. You've done wonderfully. Grateful for both the dismissal and the praise, the scout bowed to his leader and left the man alone. He needed a drink to help his nerves. All right then, Azazel began, holding up a file that had a picture of a blonde teen and a white-haired woman inside of a music store. Let's see what you've got to show, kid. When the orc arrived, they found themselves waiting in a lounge room of what Rias recognized as the Grimori estate. Grafia spoke up before she could, saying, you and your peerage will wait here until it is time. Lord Riser will be waiting at his family estate, making it so that you only meet on the board, if you will. Nodding in understanding, Rias decided to get comfortable as she waited. Her peerage followed her example, and the red-headed king was pleased to see the camaraderie between them. Issei was sitting beside Asia, helping the blonde ex nun stay calm sign her nerves were visibly getting to her. It was obvious that the two of them felt something for one another, something beyond friendship. It was also adorable how they both didn't seem to realize it, considering the obviousness of it. Kiba was beside Kaneko, the both of them having known one another long enough to be comfortable. She rarely spoke, and he never pushed her about it respecting her stoic personality while she appreciated his natural kindness. They were ready for what was about to happen. Akino was sitting on the floor across from Naruto, pointing out certain magical runes that were seen on the guitar he had brought. Based on how eager she looked, Rias could only assume that they were meant to cause nothing but misery for Riser's peerage, something she had nothing against. Naruto gave the queen his undivided attention, which was fine, but it still made Rias twitch when she saw Akino moving closer to him so that she could show him certain rune better. Memories of Akino talking about stealing Naruto away resurfaced, and that caused another twitch. Grafia returned a few minutes later, simply nodding to Rias to tell her that it was time. The club stood up together and awaited their transport, being engulfed by a large magical array that dropped them off in the middle of. Wait, Issei began, isn't this our club room? Akino shook her head and pointed to the window behind him. Take a look for yourself, Issei-kun. We're on the board, now. Complying with her suggestion, the pond looked outside and saw that the sky was filled with a colored void that reminded him of the Northern Lights head seen in some of his anime. He also couldn't see the city that surrounded Kuo Academy, only the grounds of the academy itself. This is simply a replica of the school, Rias explained. It acts as the board for our game with our clubroom being our side while the new school building is Riser's side. The gymnasium is acting as the center of the board, and so are the patch of Shulgrounds parallel to it. How do you want to go about this, Bushu? Kiba asked, summoning a basic sword with his sacred gear. I want Kaneko and Issei to head for the gym. Meet with any of the pawns Riser will send and take them out quickly. Kiba, you and Akino will take the sports track next to the gym heading around towards the new school building. Hey Anyo, what about me and Naruto-san? Asia asked nervously. Asia, you'll stay with me. Well head to the other side so that we all cross the halfway mark at relatively the same pace. And Naruto, she turned to the mute blonde, think you can go a scenic route. He smirked at what she was implying, nodding once in determination. She nodded back and turned to the others. All right then, let's get going. Sirzex sat with his wife and son Milikas, Rhea's friend, rival Sona Citri, and his fellow Satan, Seraphal Leviathan. Seraphal was a beautiful devil who had the appearance of a young woman in her late teens, save for the larger than normal beeps. She wore an outfit that a magical girl from television and manga would wear, complete with a staff meant to banish evil or something of a similar nature. Like Sona, she had black hair and stunning violet eyes that were watching the rating game attentively. So Tan, be sure to pay attention to Rhea Tan, okay? She asked her younger sister with a smile. One thing that many people saw right away whenever Seraphal was around Sona, was that she had quite the sister complex for the younger woman. Some even compared it to the complex Sirzex had for Rias. I know, sister, Sona sighed out, feeling on the fence about her current placement. On one hand, she wanted to support Rias and study how she handled the rating game, in case they ever matched up in the future. On the other hand, 
she could only handle so much of her older sister and her quirks. Who are the two people with blonde hair Rias Tan has with her? Sears X asked his wife, having met all of Rias' peerage before, save for Asia and Naruto. The young lady is Asi Argento, the nun Hyoto San spearheaded in rescuing that I spoke to you about. She possesses the sacred gear called Twilight Healing, Grafia answered diligently. Rias reincarnated her as a bishop piece. Fitting considering her sacred gear, Sirzex noted. To think my baby sister would get a nun in her peerage. There are firsts for everything, I suppose. As for the young man, Grafia continued, fighting a twitch of her lips, he's the one who accepted being the one to test the probationary piece that you had Lord Beelzebub create. Rias informed me that his name was Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto Uzumaki, eh? The Satan repeated with a chuckle. Sounds like his parents were some serious ramen fans. His joke was met with Grafia tugging at his cheek, her pointer finger and thumb pinching the skin for a firm grip. Lord Searsex, I am sure many would find your humor to be in poor taste, especially with such a dedicated young man. Okay, okay, ill watch my mouth, I promise, pleaded the man, pitiful waterfall tears streaming down his cheeks. Once his mother let go of his father's cheek and backed off, young Milikas innocently asked his father, Daddy, why did Mama do that to you? Because your father needs to learn not to behave like a child, considering his position in the netherworld, dear, Grafia answered for Sirzex. What your mother said, the current Lucifer confirmed defeatedly, much to the amusement of Seraphal. Kaneko, a little help. Issei called as he dodge rolled away from a pair of lowly twins wielding chainsaws of all things. Busy, she called back, carrying a section of gym bleachers as a makeshift club that she swung against another pair of twins, these ones being Nekomata in comparison to her Neko show. So, we face the blight on our sister race, eh? Ni, nee, the red-headed twin hissed out, prompting Kaneko's amber eyes to gain a hard look in them. Shifting her grip, she hurled the bleachers like a war spear before using her enhanced, rooked strength to leap high into the air. The twins leapt back from the throne seating just as she planned, moving right to where she was going to land. They couldn't even scream before she was upon them with a punch that shook the gymnasium with its force. Ni nee had been knocked out instantly while Lee was barely conscious. Kaneko continued her attack by roughly gripping the blue net's hair and hurling her full force at the chainsaw twins. Issei saw the flying pawn and wisely got out of the impact zone while adding his third consecutive boost to his sacred gear. Four of Lord Riser's pawns have been eliminated, the judge, one that had been handpicked by both the Grimori and Fenex house, announced. Grafia would have been the announcer, but she requested to decline so that she could spend more time with her son, something that both houses respected. Back on the board, Akino and Kiba were confronting the two knights of Riser's peerage, Carlemine and Cyrus. Carlemine, taking her role as a knight quite seriously, declared one on one combat against her opposing knight, which Kiba accepted. Now, both blonde knights were taking part in a high speed duel of blades where neither of them let up. Carlemine had the slight advantage because of her armor versus Kiba's school uniform, but it also came at a disadvantage. Sword birth. Noble rapier. Kiba declared, using his power to call forth a weapon with a needle-like blade that was incredibly light. This only enhanced his speedy assault, and his clothes did nothing to restrict his movements, unlike Carlemine in her armor. Damn it, she cursed as she received cuts to vital parts that her armor couldn't fully protect, namely her legs, which crippled her speed. She was forced to a knee after a well-placed laceration to her Achilles tendon and the feel of a thin blade beneath her cheek made her look up to see her victorious opponent. You have won, my fellow knight, she spoke with nobility fit for knights of old. With her submission, she was removed from the game and Riser was declared losing another piece. Not even a minute after, it was announced that his second knight was defeated, and Kiba looked behind him to see Akino walking over to him without so much as a dirt stain on her clothes. Enjoy yourself, senpei. Kiba asked with an awkward smile, never having fully gotten used to the sadistic nature of his superior. Not as much as I would have liked, I am afraid, she replied wistfully. Oh, woe is a queen such as I who cannot find enjoyment in a raiding game. He sweat dropped at her antics. W well, I am sure that you can find a more, 
enjoyable time facing risers, queen, he suggested with a strained smile. That made Akino smirk, lightly licking her lips. Era, the bomb queen, eh? Well just have to see, want we? And with that, she continued onward with Kiba behind her for support. Four pawns stared at the red-headed king that their master was fighting to claim and a blonde woman dressed in clergy clothing. However, they were not in a position to fight said king since they weren't in range of promotion. Their situation grew direr when they saw Rias casually raise up both arms and produce twin spheres of destruction in her palms. Mercy, Mira pleaded, with a smile befitting her devil race, Rias answered with a simple, no, before she launched both spheres that raced towards the pawns and eliminated them without hesitation. She nodded in satisfaction before she sensed a spike in power and turned to fire another destruction sphere, disintegrating a massive tree that had been launched at Asia for a sneak attack. Damn it, a voice spoke up as two women strolled forward. I thought I had her, she finished with a pout, crossing her arms beneath her bosom that was accentuated by her blue chong song. Focus, Shuelin, a brunette, one with red hair mixed in and a mask covering the right half of her face, admonished. Lord Riser told us to do everything we can to stop his fiancée. Yeah, I know that, Isabella, Shuelin fired back in annoyance. You act as if I never pay attention. If you two are done arguing, Rhea spoke up calmly, you should know that your king will never be called anything by me except for S. Beep. The insult to their master made the two rooks bristle, and Shuelin charged first with Isabella behind her. Rhea prepared to meet their charge, but it was unneeded when Issei came barreling through the window with his armored fist pulled back for a punch. She rose a brow at how it was far faster than his maximum speed before she spotted Kaneko making her way out the window he flew through. Ah, she must have thrown him to up his speed, she mused before smirking. Which means, turning back to where he flew, Riser's rooks leapt away just as Issei's fist impacted the ground, cratering it deeply with the power of his boosts and Kaneko's added throw. Shuelin looked surprised at the power while Isabella narrowed her visible eye. Where the hell did he get that strength? Did he promote? Isabella spotted Kaneko stand beside Rias while Issei stood in front of the three women. I don't think so, she spoke up. That shorter girl is a rook like us. And that explains, Shuelin pressed. She threw him to raise his momentum, which transferred to the ground. That's it. Back with Rias' group, Issei called back. Bushu, you and Asia Chan keep moving. Kaneko Chan and I will handle them. Rias looked to her rook, who gave a single nod before standing beside Issei and tightening her gloves. All right, well, leave it to you. Let's go, Asia, Rias replied. Asia looked to Issei in worry, and he responded with a determined smile. It'll be fine. Kaneko Chan has my back, after all. The bishop turned to the Neko show who just nodded once more before refocusing on the opposing rooks. That was enough for Asia to understand, and she followed her king while calling back, please, be careful. Issei heard her, but he couldn't take his eyes off his opponents in case they initiated another exchange. Instead, he quietly activated his fourth boost and shifted his body to get used to the increased energy flowing within. I still find it ironic that someone of the church can feel right at home with a group of devils, a voice spoke in his head while the gem on his gauntlet gave a brief glow. Asia Chan wanted friends more than anything, and that's what we are to her. Hum, and how far are you willing to go for those friends? I'd do anything for them, because they've done so much for me, he answered truthfully, sharing a sidelong look with Kaneko before they both took the initiative and charged Riser's rooks. Kaneko leapt halfway through her charge and aimed a punch at the ground to send a tremor forward, hoping to catch the others off balance. Issei had practiced this maneuver with her a few times to get used to the shifting ground, and his charge wasn't jostled at all as he neared Shuelin. The Chinese-dressed girl slipped slightly as she tried to meet Issei's punch with one of her own, misdirecting her attack to hit air while Issei crouched low and landed a heavy blow to her midsection. He then quickly rolled away from an axe kick that Isabella attempted having leapt into the air as Kaneko descended to avoid the tremor. She then grabbed some loosened earth and chucked it at the pawn who shattered it with a straight punch. But that was what Isabella wanted, appearing through the broken chunk of rock and dirt with a spear kick that struck his chest and sent him hurtling back. He slid to a stop on the ground and coughed out a glob of blood, 
the kick having cracked some of his ribs and nicking his lung. Shit, he groaned out, forcing himself to a knee. That's, Rook, strength for you. He absently noted that Kaneko had ripped out a tree and was using it as a bat, taking a swing that missed Isabella, but barely hit Shuelan who had just recovered from Issei's earlier blow. Looks like you could use some help, the voice spoke up once more. You offering, Issei fired back, getting to his feet with his unarmored hand gently pressing against his chest. I'll let you in on an attack that can end this. But you need an opening and a straight shot between you and them. I'll explain it while you and the kitten make it happen. Deciding to go along with it, Issei took a breath to try and push back the pain before he rushed in to help his friend. With Naruto, he was gliding above everyone on his air platform, keeping an eye on things from the air. While he couldn't see what was happening in the gymnasium, he heard the announcements and was happy that Issei and Kaneko were fine. Not long after, he heard about Kiba's victory, before he caught a brilliant flash and Akino's victory was announced. That made six pieces taken from Riser while none of his friends were eliminated. When he heard about Riser losing the rest of his pawns he looked down to see Rias, Asia, Issei, and Kaneko facing down two more of Riser's pieces. Based on the pieces he lost, and at how there were no earlier signs of magic being used, Naruto deduced that these two women were rooks. He watched Rias and Asia leave Issei and Kaneko to deal with them and observed the matchup, impressed with Issei's growth and cringing at the hit he took afterwards. While he got back on his feet, Kaneko was double teamed by Riser's rooks and he decided to intervene. Holding up his palms, he gathered wind and shaped them into twin chakrams that he slammed together and merged into a larger one. During the merge, it changed shape into a four-pointed star that he found himself vaguely familiar with, wincing as images raced across his mind. A younger version of himself, dressed in an orange tracksuit, had been kicked away by a tall man wielding a massive sword. As he skidded back across the ground, he reached into his pack and tossed some folded metal at a teenager with black hair dressed in blue and white. The black-haired teen caught the metal and unfurled it, revealing a four-bladed throwing weapon that he hurled at the swordsman with all of his might. As the weapon flew, he called out. Demon Wind Shuriken, Naruto mentally cried as he, much like the teen in his vision, hurled the wind-based weapon at Riser's rooks below. He wanted to see if he had helped his friends, but approaching heat caught his attention and he had his platform descend rapidly to avoid a fireball that had been launched at him. I missed. A young woman cursed. She had black hair and light brown eyes while her kimono was intricately colored with a mix of purple, orange, and pink. Beside her was a familiar blonde woman with dark blue eyes. She wore a pink dress with white frills and a magenta bow in the front. Her hair was styled in twin tails that had drilling ends that Naruto found to be rather unique. However, he was more worried about the flaming wings that protruded from her back as she floated before him. So, the kimono-wearing bishop continued, you're the one who cut off Lord Riser's hand during that meeting over a week ago, yes. He nodded, I will give you one chance to apologize for that attack on my master, and I promise your defeat will be quick and painless. He frowned and shook his head, making her frown back. And why not? He reached into his shirt pocket and prepared to write his response, only to have to evade another fireball from the bishop that forced him to drop his notepad. I won't have you writing down any runes to attack us with. Mahai yelled out, preparing another fire spell. She stopped when she saw Naruto wave his hands at her before making gestures with them that she couldn't understand. Are you trying to annoy me? Because you're succeeding. Ravel didn't say anything in response to her fellow bishop's growing ire, instead recalling lessons she had received when she was younger. While it was true that devils could speak any language, sign language was not a spoken language. This was an exception to them, and it was a language that they needed to study and learn like humans do naturally. She was fortunate enough to have learned from her mother, so she was able to decipher what it was that her fellow blonde was saying to them. Mahai, relax, she finally spoke up. He's not trying to annoy you, he's using sign language. Sign language, what, is he mute or something? She asked, still annoyed at how he could have been insulting her. Naruto nodded at the query, deciding to be polite and introduce himself. He slowly signed out his name before pointing to himself while Ravel translated. Na, Ru, Tu, Yu, Zu, Maki. She repeated, 
earning a nod while he gave her a polite bow. While his mother tended to ignore most customs and treat everyone equally, his father had instilled in him a measure of manners that he had memorized. While he didn't like them like his mother, he knew that they were needed in certain situations, like trying to calm down an angry devil woman who misunderstood what he was trying to say. Unknown to him, his introduction to Ravel had been highlighted on the viewing screen, and someone from his past had witnessed it. Violet eyes widened at what she had just witnessed, focusing on the whiskered blonde on the screen. That boy looked just like. But it couldn't be him, right? He was killed with his family, she was sure of it, she had wept because of it. And he was part of Rhea's peerage. When did that happen? As she cupped her hands over her mouth, her breathing started to pick up and tears stung her eyes. He was alive, her young maestro, she could hardly believe it. Dear, a red-headed man who looked like a slightly older Sirzex spoke up in concern. She didn't hear him, too lost in her thoughts. How long had it been since she had seen him? The last time they'd been together one was years ago, and he was such a cute little thing back then. Looking at the images he made sign language gestures to that Phoenix girl, she couldn't help but sob joyously. She thought he was dead. Oh, being wrong never felt so wonderful. Venelana, the man, Zeodicus, tried again, but he was again unsuccessful. Head grown so well, and he had aerokinesis. Where did that power come from? What did it matter? He was alive. Oh, by all things holy and damned alike, if she'd known he was still alive before now, things would have been different. She shook all over and then bolted to her feet. She had to see him again in person. First thing as soon as this raiding game was over, she had to go see him. She had to see if he remembered her, had to let him know she hadn't meant to leave him alone after that living nightmare of a day. She had to let him know she still cared for him. Her poor little maestro, if only he had known how to use the summoning contract back then. As she took off, Zeodicus ran after her in worry, following her to his wife's personal study. He watched as she looked through her albums, desperately looking for one in particular that he couldn't see. He saw her perk up and pull out a familiar album of those whom she had contracts with. It was a hobby of hers that he found adorable and had teased her about. In it were all her contracts, some old and some new, but none left out. He watched as she flipped through it saw the one she was looking for, one that could have been mistaken for a family photo. Looking over her shoulder, he recognized it as a photo of his wife with four humans. He couldn't remember what their names were, but the little boy with whiskered cheeks was definitely familiar, for it was the young man on Rhea's peerage. I thought he was dead, he heard Venelana choke out, some tears falling onto the laminated picture. His father had signed a contract with me years ago, and he had asked me to help watch over his son and teach him a few things. He had just lost his wife, and he was lost emotionally and parentally. Zeodicus wrapped an arm around his wife, holding her close to him so he could comfort her. He was such a sweet boy, she continued. He practiced so many different instruments for hours, and it wasn't until Monado-san told me why that I found out. His wife had siren blood. Siren. Zeodicus repeated in slight surprise. But they are one of the most reclusive races. Kashina San, his mother, left her clan to be with Monado San, Venelana explained. Naruto kun would have had her gifts if he didn't blow out his vocal cords on the night he was born. Monado San told me that Naruto kun practiced every day so that he could keep some link between himself and his mother. After he and his family were killed, I had assumed that Naruto was dead too. He filled in the blanks, realizing what had made his wife act this way. And seeing him today brought back all these memories and emotions. I remember you wouldn't let Rias go for hours after you came back one day. Was it the day his family died? She nodded. Yes, but now, I know he's alive. She turned around to face him, her misty eyes gazing deeply into his own. I need to see him, dear. After our daughter's rating game, win or lose, I need to see him. He rested a hand against her cheek, thumbing away a tear gently with a warm smile. You will, my love. It'll help make it happen. Back with Issei and Kaneko, the pawn had recuperated enough to try and assist his partner, Rook, by taking on Shuelen while the Nekosho took on Isabella. That was easier said than done, considering how she had trained in a certain style for years while he had only trained seriously for ten days. Duck. 
He complied, wincing at his aching ribs before trying to punch the girl. She redirected the punch and moved away from him, resuming her stance as he got back to his feet. Damn it, I need a distraction. As if the universe answered his call, he saw Isabella get kicked by Kaneko and tumble into Shuelan, both of them landing in a heap just in time for sharp discs made of razor wind to land beside them before dispersing. The wind blades had cut into their sides enough for a steady outflow of blood, forcing them to hold a hand to their new wounds while they looked around for the culprit. Issei blinked at the lucky break before he shook off his surprise and pulled his arm back. Punching it forward, he unleashed a burst of raw energy with a roar of, dragon shot. The energy blasted from his extended fist, racing forward as the tip of it took the shape of a dragon's head with its jaws wide. It was upon them in nearly an instant, clamping its jaws down on them as the energy exploded in a massive cloud of dust and smoke. Lord Riser's two, rooks, have been eliminated. Ravel's eyes widened at that, and she looked down to where her fellow pieces were. Mahai looked too, concerned for her comrades and trying to figure out how in the netherworld they were both eliminated at once. Mahai, go check the situation, Ravel ordered. Be but, milady, she tried to argue. Go, ill keep our guest occupied. Mahai looked ready to argue again, but she stopped herself and listened to her master's younger sibling. Giving Naruto a warning glare, she flew down towards Issei and Kaneko. Naruto made to follow her, knowing that she could catch his friends by surprise. Ravel saw him attempt to go help Rias pieces, narrowing her eyes before she summoned two magical arrays in her palms. The first held her family crest while the second had the universal symbol for restraint. Launching them skyward, she created a box-like confined space that gained purple walls and gave off great heat. Naruto was barely able to halt his movement, stopping himself from slamming into the wall before him. He turned to Ravel, who crossed her arms beneath her budding chest. Sorry, but I can't let you help them, she stated firmly. This is between us, Naruto-san. With the reverse barrier formed, and Mahai leaving to confront the enemy unimpeded, Ravel took a breath to compose herself before performing a noble curtsy. The gesture caught Naruto off guard, enough for him not to do anything to try and break the barrier. Knowing that she had his attention, she addressed her fellow blonde, my name is Ravel Fenex, daughter of Lord and Lady Fenex. And as much as my duties to the peerage I am part of dictate I must be your opponent, I would like to apologize first and foremost to you on behalf of the Fenex family. You want to apologize before we even start fighting. Naruto signed with a deadpanned expression. Sheesh, he heard five speak up from within his head, overconfidence must have really run in the Fenex family. Not that. I mean for what happened over a week ago when you cut off Riser's hand. As much as I don't like it, my brother did ask for it. Insulting someone's family, threatening their friends, there's pride, and then there's going out of your way to be callous. Riser crossed that line, as a member of the House of Phoenix, I apologize for the audacity shown to you by a member of our family. Naruto frowned, so that was what she was apologizing for. He let out a deep sigh and signed his response to that. I can't accept that from you. Closing curly bracket. That made her stop short. Excuse me, she asked, slightly stunned. I understand that you have every right and reason to be angry, but can you at least understand that Riser doesn't represent the views of our entire who? A. Ravel started to say, but Naruto cut her off with a raised hand. Let me finish. While I do understand how and why you want to apologize, I can't accept it from you since you and the Fenex family did nothing to need to apologize to me for. Riser was the one who did. So, there's no point in blaming the whole for the misdeeds of a single part. That's why I can't accept it. There isn't any need for you to shoulder the responsibility because he's an asshole. Closing curly bracket. Ravel jerked back in slight surprise, before she smiled with the radiance of a bonfire at that. I see. You've drawn a line between the House of Phoenix members and Riser since you hold him solely accountable for his actions. I thank you for that, and in all due honesty, you are correct about my brother. Even my father, my mother, and my other two older brothers find themselves frustrated with Riser. He is far too condescending and refuses to accept that the Phoenix family and our abilities are not absolute. Naruto rolled his eyes. Why did that not surprise him? Because he's a pretentious prick. 
The intoners all asked at once, earning a mental chuckle from him. Well, now that we've dealt with that concern, shall we get started? She invited, as if the matchup between herself and him were a formal event. Naruto narrowed his eyes and unstrapped his guitar, holding it in front of him as his eyes bled green. He said nothing as she took her own stance, fire dancing in her right hand between the fingers. Strange choice of weapon to bring to a raiding game, she commented before she unleashed an arc of flames that he glided around. Are you going to try and appeal to my musical side? She continued in jest, letting off a volley of thunderbolts. He simply smirked at her joke, gathering wind in his hand before strumming the guitar with force, lighting up the runes on it and emitting a sound wave that repelled the lightning and sent it scattering into the barrier walls. He then began to play a series of complicated notes that gave off the feeling a rock solo, sending out concussive bursts of wind and sound that rippled across the air as they raced towards her. Her eyes widened at the unexpected attack, using her own control of wind to redirect the blasts. In the clear, she turned with more fire on hand before she yelped and flew upward to avoid a wind spear that had been thrust at her, held tightly in Naruto's hand. He released it as he turned around, having the tip point at her like a massive arrow before he strummed the guitar once more, firing it like a ballistic bolt that cut through the air at her. She narrowed her eyes and created a flaming javelin that she hurled at the wind bolt, sending her own burst of wind to enhance her flames and increase the speed of her javelin. She then folded her wings in front of her, cupping her hands around the tips to produce a steadily growing sphere of white-hot fire. Looking away from her work for a moment, she smirked when she saw her fire javelin take on the wind bolt, grow larger from its wind, and continue racing towards her opponent. He's got impressive control over wind, she mentally praised. But the House of Phoenix are masters of fire and wind. He won't win. Naruto narrowed his eyes at the incoming javelin, grasping the guitar by its neck before hurling it at the inferno. He watched sadly as the musical instrument impacted with the fire, lighting up more runes before being engulfed in a massive explosion that dispelled the flames so he wouldn't be engulfed. Through the smoke, he saw Ravel holding her arms up as a house-sized ball of fire floated above her. His green eyes widened at that, feeling the heat from his positions yards away. This is it, Naruto-san. He heard Ravel call out to him. This is my strongest fireball. I doubt you'll be able to survive, so I'll say right now that I am impressed. I wish I could have had someone like you in my future peerage. His expression turned blank as he raised a hand to his face, covering his eyes from her point of view. In a single swipe, he tore his hand away and revealed his sacred gear to the masses. It took on the form of pure white headphones that looked futuristic in style and fully covered his ears. On the outsides of them, there looked to be ventilation that distorted the air around them while a green holographic visor connected between the headphones in front of his eyes. To be continue, thank you for watching.